Welcome to the second annual, The Educated Patient, a Liver Cancer Conference, presented by Exelixis. We would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors for their continued commitment to our organization and mission. Our presenting sponsor, Exelixis, premier sponsors and supporters, Asai and Genetech, our premier sponsors, and our supporting, our signature supporter, Merck, as well as our clinical trial session sponsor, Eureka Therapeutics. We appreciate their continued support of our organization and mission. Please take a moment to review this disclaimer as this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel. And today and tomorrow to eliminate background noise, only the speaker's microphone and cameras are enabled. Everyone else is muted. For optimum viewing, we ask that everyone be in speaker view. So please expand the view menu in the top right corner and click speaker. And during the presentations, if you have a question, please hover your mouse over the button of your screen and click on chat then simply type your question in the chat box. You may enter questions at any point during the presentation. The speakers will answer questions during the Q&A portions of the conference. And once again, we remind you that this webinar is being recorded. All attendees will receive a link to the video via email for on-demand viewing and sharing. I would now like to recognize our amazing planning committee for their hard work in creating an engaging and informative conference. Dr. Abu Alpha of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Dr. Esrin of Rush University Medical Center, Dr. Guy with California Pacific Medical Center, Dr. Taddy of Yale University, and Dr. Zarampar with University of Florida Health. Thank you for creating an amazing conference. And we would also like to send a special thank you. The planning committee would like to send a special thank you to our speakers over the next two days. Dr. Verma from Einstein Healthcare Network, Dr. Kalman from Einstein Healthcare Network, Dr. Hamid of University of California, San Francisco, Dr. McDonald with the University of Chicago Medical Center, and Dr. Wong with Stanford University School of Medicine. Thank you so much for taking the time to support our conference and speaking. Now we will have a video from our presenting sponsor. When I think back on the last 25 years for the company, the learnings are deep and somewhat profound. We've done it our way. This is a hard business, but it's a really great business to be in when you've got the right team and the right mindset to go off and really attack some of the hardest problems in biomedical research. I think for most of us, when we start a company in the biomedical space, the objective is fairly narrow. We just want to solve a scientific problem. Hopefully the solution to that problem may lead to a drug. From everything from access to government affairs to all touch points in the organization, the patient is at the focus. Patients aren't only front and center in what we do. But Exelixis also works with a variety of patient advocacy organizations who work with us to create a united front and good public health policy. As every aspect of the organization evolves, how do we have the vision to create the next wave of clinical studies that will help address those patients' needs, even as better therapies come onto the market? I would now like to introduce our moderator for today. Dr. Guy is not only our member of our planning committee, but she is a transplant hepatologist and director of the liver cancer program at California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco. She also leads the hepatology division there and is the chief patient experience officer for 
for advanced organ therapies and transplant. Thank you so much, Dr. Guy. I will now turn it over to you. And before we get going, I just wanted to take a moment on behalf of the physicians speaking today and the organizing committee to say thank you to Ivory Allison and the American Liver Foundation team for their wonderful commitment to the patients and caregivers that are here today and for their consistent advocacy and vision. This is the second annual American Liver Foundation Conference for patients and caregivers, and we host it in October because October is Liver Cancer Awareness Month. We feel how special this event is, is it brings patients and providers together to talk about liver cancer, what it is, how to manage it, and importantly, how to care for ourselves and others throughout the cancer journey. The American Liver Foundation does a great job of creating community, and we hope today and tomorrow that you get that feeling from your living room or from your office, wherever you are joining us today. So moving along with the program, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Tamar Taddy who will speak to us on Liver Cancer 101. Dr. Taddy is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the section of Digestive Diseases at Yale University. She directs the Liver Cancer Program at the VA in Connecticut and runs the Regional Liver Tumor Board that serves Southern England's VA Medical Center. In addition, Dr. Taddy is an example that we should all aim to follow. She is the leader of the National Advisory Committee for the American Liver Foundation, and in this role, she brings together clinicians and researchers from across the country, and she helps us focus on the successes and the challenges we face in liver cancer. She is a creative and thoughtful voice and an example for all of us to follow. So thank you for your leadership, and take it away. Thanks so much. Dr. Guy, I really appreciate the kind introduction. And I wanted really to extend my thanks also to all of the ALF organizers, um, the sponsors, and also really just the, the group of people who came together across the healthcare field. So we have a lot of different healthcare experts today to talk to you about liver cancer, um, as well as patients, families, and really anyone who's joining us who's interested in learning more about liver cancer. So my goal in the next 20 minutes is really to give you sort of a feel for what's going to be coming in greater detail today, sort of a liver cancer 101. And to do that, I think it's really important to understand that liver cancer is a unique cancer and it's a cancer that usually arises in the setting of cirrhosis or advanced liver disease. And that type of cancer is called hepatocellular carcinoma. There is another primary liver cancer called cholangiocarcinoma, which can arise in people with liver disease, but also arises in people without underlying liver disease. And to set the stage today, I'm really going to be focusing on hepatocellular carcinoma because HCC, as we call it, is the most common form of primary liver cancer, accounting for about 75% of liver cancer. It's the leading cause of death in cirrhosis and it is a, a leading cause of death globally. In fact, it's the second leading cause of cancer death around the world with an estimated 850,000 cases across the globe, new cases every year and close to 800,000 deaths. Um, so this is a global um, cancer uh, that's on the rise and it's, it depends where you live in terms of whether it's actually rising or declining. And a lot of that has to do with the risk factors that underlie liver cancer and cirrhosis. In the United States, we expect upwards of 45,000 new diagnoses of liver cancer this year, which means that if you're facing liver cancer, by no means are you alone. And we understand that this is a cancer that needs urgently both research and um, support for care and for coordinated care. So let's talk a little bit about why HCC is unique. It's because it arises in chronic liver disease that makes treatment challenging. It also makes staging challenging because if you have liver disease, you may be ill from your liver disease. And then if you get a cancer on top of that, it really changes how we approach you. So on the one hand, you think cancer's the big C, it's very frightening, people, automatically clam up when they hear that diagnosis, but oftentimes it's quite possible that you've been dealing with chronic liver disease and this then comes as an additive and it's even more daunting to think about how to treat that cancer in the context of liver disease. And because people have underlying liver disease, it's also a challenge to science. 
because we have to develop clinical trials that are rational for the population at hand, meaning we don't wanna give drugs that are overly toxic or that would cause liver failure to a person who already has a liver that's not working properly. The other interesting thing about liver cancer is that it can be diagnosed by imaging. And because of that, we have not really developed a biobank over a continuum of disease. We have a lot of specimens that we've collected in different research arenas for early stage diagnosis when people have their cancer resected or surgically removed. And that gives us some idea of the biological underpinnings of liver cancer, but we really haven't reached um, the stage of say other cancers like lung cancer and breast cancer where we have um, samples that are taken from patients over a course of their entire continuum with cancer that would inform clinical trials for more advanced stage cancers. And we're getting there, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So we have a solid organ malignancy, liver cancer, that can be diagnosed by imaging. And it's diagnosed usually by a CT scan or an MRI. Biopsy is considered when these cancers don't look totally characteristic on imaging. And the reason that we can diagnose liver cancer by imaging is because the cancers do look so very characteristic. It's also the only solid organ malignancy or cancer for which transplantation offers a cure. And that cure can be a decades long cure, so many decades. And so it's very important to know if we're dealing with early stage disease that could be transplantable versus later stage disease because the criteria that govern whether a tumor is suitable for transplantation to basically take the liver out with its cancer and put a brand new liver in, they're very, very discreet. And we know these, have, these guidelines have to be followed to prevent recurrence of the cancer in the transplanted organ or elsewhere in the body. So not all liver cancer can be cured with a transplant or with a surgery. And most liver cancer is still diagnosed in more advanced stages. So why do people get liver cancer? And it's really because the um, sort of cascades that lead to inflammation and scarring in the liver ultimately lead to cirrhosis. And along the way, um, those uh, changes that happen in the liver cause almost a field effect to promote tumor development. And so it's very important that people with chronic liver disease, if they have cir cirrhosis, are getting ultrasound screening every six months. And so an ultrasound can be used to detect cancer for screening, not for diagnosis. An ultrasound shows us if there's a mass in the liver. And then we go on to more imaging that's more sensitive to actually look for the liver cancer and determine the tumor burden and what's involved in the liver. It's also important to know that among all the different avenues that lead to cirrhosis, there are certain populations that may develop liver cancer in the absence of cirrhosis. And those are people with chronic hepatitis B, which is endemic around the world, and also people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There's some emerging studies that would suggest that they may develop liver cancer without first developing cirrhosis. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done still in defining populations at risk and in informing screening guidelines. It's really important if you've had hepatitis C and you've been cured of your hepatitis C that you actually continue to get ultrasounds if you have cirrhosis at the time of your cure. So that's really important not to forget. Now, when we talk about staging, it's important also to understand that staging is really thinking about not just the tumor and its size or whether it's gone, for example, into the blood vessel or outside the liver, but actually the underlying liver disease. And that's really important. You need to have a dialogue with your doctors about you know, where your liver disease stands in terms of the tumor. We don't separate these things. You're one person and we need to really think about the cancer in the context of your liver disease. And so people get very hung up on stage because you know, it's in other cancers, people say, oh, I have stage one this or stage four that. And I think people understand that stage is on a continuum and you know, 
really defines whether you're gonna live or die. It's not so much the case in liver cancer because the stage is really dependent on the liver disease as well. So yes, we look at tumor size. Of course, we look at whether the tumor is outside the liver, but we're really looking at you and how your liver functions and how you're doing essentially. So stage is an important conversation. There are other tests that are done to stage liver disease and liver cancer specifically. So if you're diagnosed with a liver cancer, you will likely get a chest CT and that's to exclude that the cancer has gone elsewhere since liver cancer often goes to the lungs in more advanced stages. We tend to think about the stages of liver cancer as early, intermediate and advanced rather than the typical stage one through four. And so that whole discussion around staging really requires a team approach. And it's important to know that most liver cancers are dealt with in a tertiary care center where you have specialists from all different walks of medicine who come together, not just to look at your images, but to think about your liver function, to think about your other medical problems, and also to come up with a plan that's right for you specifically. So that's important. You are actually the most valuable member of a very big team. And along the continuum of liver cancer diagnosis and treatment, sometimes the positions may change or the players may change, but you will always be the focus, which is why you really have to let us know your wishes, your dreams, your hopes, the things that sort of make you tick and we also need to look at all of these things in the context of your whole life, your family, your aspirations, your children, your parents. So it's, it's really a holistic approach. And because liver cancer is very complicated, it requires that team approach. It's really, really important to remember that. So this is a team sport and you're the MVP. So let's think a little bit about um, why we uh, stage a person. It's really to understand their tumor burden in the context of their liver disease, which then allows us to think about treatments. So there are many treatments for liver cancer now, and it's really important that you understand the degree of your liver disease, your stage, and what treatments are available for you. And these are usually conveyed to you by your physician after your case is discussed at a tumor board. And so the, it's really important to have that conversation and to say, how did you arrive at this decision and what options are available for me? And sometimes it's really important to know that um, things may change over time. So we may over time diagnose a very early stage cancer, which we're able to keep you alive for hopefully decades. <laughs> Um, and then we actually think about different treatments along the continuum of, of the cancer and the cancer's worsening, for example. But I think it's important to know that in just the last six years, we've seen um, the emergence of many, many treatments now for liver cancer, um, specifically in the advanced stages. Um, so we are actually seeing people live much longer than we previously thought. Uh, and liver cancer although it is transplantable in the early stage, it's also important to know that people often wait for a transplant and biology is unpredictable. So you may be on a transplant list, for example, but you may not um, make it to transplant because your tumor may grow or change. Uh, and it's, it can be very distressing, but understand that liver cancer is on a continuum and your team has your back no matter what stage you're at, okay? So it's important to have a very open line of communication with your team to understand that things may change and to always know that people are planning around those changes to provide the best care possible for you. The important thing is that you are part of that conversation. So when you think also about liver cancer in the context of dealing with other medical problems, it's important to know that um, these treatments are often decided upon in the context of other medical problems. So just like we may think about different imaging modalities for diagnosing HCC, for example, an MRI or a CT, we'll often think about what other problems you may have that may prevent one 
modality over another or make one better than another. Same thing with treatment. We actually think about sometimes the location of the tumors, if they're close to blood vessels or close to other visceral organs. We think oftentimes about um, you know, whether surgery is really the right thing or whether more um, you know, local and less invasive treatments can do the, you know, have the same effect. So all of these things are, are actually open for discussion in the context of the individual patient. And we follow very careful guidelines, but it's also important to know that guidelines are guidelines. They're guidance for populations, but individuals require a very careful plan. And that plan is derived in a tumor board. So just know that, you know, when we meet today, and one of the reasons I put this, you know, garden background on is because I, I really want you to have a sense that this is a conference where we can engage in dialogue, where we're not really having the sterile conversations at the doctor's office when you're sort of scared out of your mind and you have a million questions that come to you afterwards. Um, you know, this conference is time for you to talk to doctors and healthcare providers who can give you, you know, essentially the state of the, the art in terms of what's going on in liver cancer. And we want you to really feel like you have a seat at the table of this conversation. So it's, it's also really important to know that you have a million questions after you've gotten this diagnosis. We know that we want to answer them. And we know that we can't always do that in one sitting. So call us with your questions, you know, see us in the office, get to know our teams. We have teams. So we have teams of nurses and care coordinators who are there to help you, help you help your family. And the other important thing to know is that symptomatic care of the patient with liver disease and liver cancer is extremely important. So liver disease in and of itself carries a lot of symptom burden. People feel fatigued. They can have problems related to their liver function that may cause confusion or development of fluid in the belly or the legs or um, internal bleeding, things like that. And those, those developments with liver disease, they can be treated and they need to be treated in order for, for example, you to have any hope of getting treatment for a cancer, for example. So optimization of your liver function is really important. And then for people who have very good liver function, but they develop a cancer, the cancer in and of itself may cause symptoms too. And there's an entire group of providers called palliative care providers, whose job it is to actually bring a holistic approach to symptom management and to make sure that your needs are being met, meaning that you do have a dialogue about what's important to you. You do have a dialogue about your symptoms and how to control them, and that your caregiver is involved in that dialogue, okay? So we wanna think about not really your cancer per se, but you and what's best for you. So it's just, very important for um, you all to come away with this idea that this is a very rapidly moving field, okay? So liver cancer, as I said, in the past six, year, six years, we've seen so many drugs come to market. Even today, we have um, a press release about a trial that shows a, a positive result. So it's quite likely that you may be eligible for a clinical trial along the way. And it's important to know that clinical trials really move the field forward. You should always ask your physician about your eligibility for clinical trials. There is a um, clinicaltrials.gov website where you can look up clinical trials for liver cancer. And really it's important to bring this up with your healthcare providers. Um, now, oftentimes in tumor board, we will discuss clinical trials for which you may be eligible. And so we'll bring those to your attention when we see you in clinic. The important thing, again, the takeaway is that we do this as a team. So the tumor board's a team, your providers are a team, you're on this team, you're the center of this team. And we know that recent data has shown that tumor boards actually do prolong life in liver cancer, irrespective of what treatment is given. And it's because people come together to discuss each person's individual case and their care plan. So I'm not gonna go into all the different treatments for liver cancer because you're gonna hear a lot about that today. Um, just know that the treatments are usually divided into curative treatments, meaning that they will result in a long period of time without 
um, recurrence, although the field effect that I discussed earlier of the liver sort of uh, providing a fertile ground with liver disease for liver cancer, that often means that there may be more than one cancer that grows in the liver and that the recurrence rate of liver cancer can be very high. So even when we think about curative therapies, we think about them in the context of the underlying liver disease. There are palliative therapies, which are um, very good at prolonging life on the order of years. And there are systemic therapies that, as I told you, we've had a, a barrage of new, very promising drugs, and soon we will have promising combinations. We already have a combination for the best first-line therapy in advanced liver cancer. And my feeling is that over time, we're going to move into a, a time where we can actually use multiple therapies for liver cancer that we hadn't thought about before. So, um, so just know that the field is moving quickly and that's a good thing. It's good to have options. So we've seen a lot of new milestones in liver cancer treatment in just the past five or six years. And it's important to know that we really, really care about you and we want to be able to give you options that will prolong your life that will pro prolong your life with the quality of life that you need to spend it with your family doing the things you like to do. So I'm gonna stop here um, and turn it back over to, to Dr. Guy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Patty, that was excellent. So I'd like to introduce um, a video from our premier sponsor, Asai. Asai support and commitment for the Liver Cancer Conference. I am back because I would like to now introduce, reintroduce Dr. Guy. Uh, she is not only our moderator today, but she is also one of the presenters, and she'll be speaking on everything you need to know about liver cancer screening and surveillance. Back to you, Dr. Guy. Thank you, Ivory. So now that we know a lot about liver cancer. Um, we wanted to spend a moment talking about screening and surveillance for liver cancer and what that means. So Dr. Taddy told you about what liver cancer is and mentioned about who's at risk for liver cancer. And the idea of a screening or another word is a surveillance program is that there are groups of people who are at higher risk for liver cancer and we can identify them and then apply a test to detect liver cancer if it develops. So screening is a one-time test, whereas surveillance is a program that applies tests over a period of time. So therefore, with liver cancer, it's really a surveillance program because we're monitoring at specific intervals over time for the development of liver cancer that we know has an annual risk that I'm going to review a bit about. So the first thing I wanted to do was just a reminder about who are these increased risks for liver cancer. The first group is to think about hepatitis B. And hepatitis B, because it's a DNA virus, there is a risk of liver cancer, whether or not you have scarring and cirrhosis of the liver. And so for people who have hepatitis B, we think about uh, stage, uh, surveilling them differently than people who have cirrhosis. So in hepatitis B, if patients are over the age of 40 and are an Asian, it's recommended in men over 40 that they undergo surveillance. And I'm going to talk about the tests in a moment. And in women, Asian women over the age of 50, we recommend that they start to undergo surveillance. And there are some other subgroups within the group of hepatitis B that we could talk about as well. These are patients without cirrhosis. Patients with hepatitis B, however, can develop cirrhosis, and those patients should also be on our surveillance protocol. Another group of patients that we need to be surveying are patients with cirrhosis in general from different causes. 
And the most common causes of cirrhosis in this country are hepatitis B, I mean, hepatitis C, alcohol and fatty liver disease. But there are other causes of cirrhosis that many people on the phone may have. And in those situations, we also recommend that people undergo surveillance. So let's talk about surveillance and what kind of tests we recommend. There, we can break these tests up into radiographic tests and into blood tests. So the radiographic test we use for surveillance in liver cancer is the ultrasound. And the thing about ultrasound is it's good, but it's not perfect. And so we want to be surveying over time to ensure that if there is a spot, a lesion, a tumor that develops, we identify it and then we move on to next steps to understand what the spot actually means. Is it cirrhosis, is it cancer or not? The other group of tests we use is, is a blood test called an alpha feeder protein. And again, this test is good, but it's not perfect. And in fact, up to 30% of people who have liver cancer can have a normal value on this alpha feeder protein. And people will ask me often in the clinic, well, what about my alpha feeder protein level? Is this something I should be concerned about? And we use that level in addition to radiographic studies. This is what's really important is that we use them in combination. And so sometimes the level alone, if it's low, isn't necessarily all that helpful, but we do follow the trend as well to get a sense. And so what I like to just remind people of is all that we do and what Dr. Taddy was also talking about is that everything is in the context of the patient and the specific clinical features. And so we use alpha feeder protein as part of a context in trying to understand someone's risk. So now let's move on to talking about the timing of these tests. So as I mentioned, surveillance is a program of looking for cancer over time once a high risk group of people has been identified. And what we've learned is that surveying for liver cancer is important that we do it continually over time. And the recommendation is that it should be done every six months. So what that means is our patients with cirrhosis or with hepatitis B with or without cirrhosis are undergoing an ultrasound and lab test every six months. And that can be challenging. I know, again, everyone has their lives and they're busy and they're trying to do all the different things they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But remembering to calendar in that every six months, if you are at risk to be getting your ultrasound and your alpha feeder protein. Oftentimes, what can happen is a spot will be found on ultrasound, and then we need to understand, well, what does this mean? Is this clinically worrisome or not? And one of the things to know about ultrasound is it's really a two-dimensional test that represents shades of gray, so black, white, and gray. And sometimes we can be unclear about what a lesion means on an ultrasound, and then we need to go up to follow-up testing, which would include either a CT scan or an MRI. And those are really the best tests to move forward with diagnosis of liver cancer once an abnormality has been determined, as Dr. Taddy was saying. So this is a real basic overview of surveillance and screening, and I welcome any questions that would come in the Q&A. Uh, but now we're going to move along um, to um, our next program, um, and I wanted to see if Dr. Abu Alpha is here. Not quite yet. Yes, I am we here. You are, wonderful. Okay, well, this is my absolute pleasure. He's, I, he's closing his door, I can see. There you are. Um, this is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Abba Alpha. Um, he's a board certified oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, and he treats patients with gastrointestinal cancers and liver cancer. And you know, we talk about giants in the field and Dr. Alba Alpha really is that for liver cancer. His work on understanding how to apply systemic therapy to liver cancer has really changed how we think about liver cancer and has really resulted in lots of great benefits for patients. Um, but in addition to his expertise um, and leadership, one of the things that's so wonderful about Dr. Alba Alpha is he's welcoming and kind and he really has been a force in bringing the liver cancer community together in collaboration. And that's what you all want to see with your physicians is that we're reaching out when we have questions and he's often the person we reach out to. So thank you, Dr. Alba for speaking about treatments. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Guy. And uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody, or wherever you are all over the world. Uh, if anything, number one, congratulations for the uh, Liver Cancer Awareness Month. And of course, a big thank and congratulations for the American Liver Foundation for really 
continuing to take the lead in regard to this very important month. Well, wholeheartedly, we as a team, and when we say team, it's the physicians, the patients, the loved ones, all together, uh, we are together to really fight this dreadly disease. And I'm really greatly honored uh, to again join uh, my very dear colleagues. And really, we are a team. And you should see how much we interact among each other for whatever is best for patients. Uh, I know you heard a lot today. And if anything, I'm going to try, as I was tasked uh, to, to do, is to really try to bring in the therapy back into perspective uh, just to see where things go. And of course, it's totally understandable that uh, any of the patients with liver cancer, they're going to come say, you know what, I have this problem, I want it behind me, and I want to move on. This is really how we all live in life. Like, you know, we have a problem, want to fix it and move on. And if anything, uh, you realize that, uh, yes, we are hopefully capable of doing that, but sadly, not necessarily all the time. But it does not mean if we cannot do a fuel cure, in other words, get rid of the disease, it's the end of the story. Absolutely not. How many of us, all of us, without any exception, have some little problems in our lives here and there, and we still live our life without necessarily having it impact us in any way. And this is what we probably are continuing to use is to kind of like new methodologies, new approaches to really make sure that people are living with cancer, not necessarily just throw cancer behind us and move on. Yes, we like that, but that doesn't mean that we cannot live with cancer. So it's not the fight about cancer or against cancer, it's about living with cancer. So with this kind of perspective, and I'm on purpose brought this up first because it's gonna be very important how we delineate the different therapeutic interventions. And of course, I'll start from the top of the pyramid, understand what we all would like to, uh, to think of. Of course, that's very straightforward. Small, limited disease in the liver, very good liver function, take it out, absolutely. Surgery is totally appropriate and uh, applicable. At the same time, if it's a small disease in the liver, very small, really even smaller than small, a couple of centimeters, no more, or in other words, less than an inch, and good liver function, we can even ablate it. Ablate it means we're just going to burn it with some technique that the interventional radiologist and same time, like Dr. Bo yesterday, you heard, or at the same time, surgeons sometimes will do. Now, as you already kind of, you know, heard, uh, Dr. Guy, she's expert, and Dr. Tadei as well, is that if the liver function is not that good, i.e., yes, the cancer is there, it's limited, but the liver is not doing that well, this is where transplant comes into play. And this is where we not only get rid of the cancer, but we're actually changing the liver to a liver which is now more functional and able to sustain our life. Now, those three curative intents, as we said, in regard to surgery, radiofrequency ablation, and also transplant, add to some other, you know, less used nowadays, different intervention like alcohol injection, what have we, but the three ones, surgery, radiofrequency ablation, and transplant. We're very happy to see them happening for many patients, but we have to remember it's not going to be applicable for all patients. But it does not mean if we don't hear any of those three choices, that's it. The story is over. Absolutely not. And I really mean that because after all, as a medical oncologist, I can tell you, I, 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 I number one, I'm busy. I like like everybody else, which is good. It means that we are able to help patients because sadly, if there was nothing else to do, we'll not be busy. So it's very important to remember, yes, we have a lot of kind of, you know, assets, a lot of opportunities to help patients. So as we move from the pyramid, and on purpose, I called it the pyramid because as we can imagine, the top of the pyramid is a very narrow kind of part of the triangle where we can do those curative intent we just spoke about. But then we come next to what we call locally advanced disease. You're going to hear that here and there, and it says that the cancer is still in the liver only, but it's probably more extensive than it should have been. And in other words, where all those three options that we just gave in, in regard to surgery, radiofrequency ablation, or transplant are not applicable. This is where the art of local therapy come into play. And this is, to give credit, is a very well-established intervention that can be done and can take care of the liver. If anything, it's very straightforward. What the doctors will do, they usually are the interventional radiologists, highly expert, high expertise in regard to doing a catheterization. In other words, they build in a kind of a catheter, 
Same like with the heart catheter. They put it in the groin and they travel with it all the way to the liver. And there, the liver has a big plus. The liver sustained actually two blood supplies. It's like, imagine, like you have like electricity power in your home from two sources. The power that comes to you as well as the generator maybe. Same thing, the liver has double, double, double blood supply. Why is that? Because by nature, the liver is a very important industry in our body that clean up the blood as it comes from the lower part of the body as it goes to the heart. So that kind of blood passing by to be cleaned by the liver is still blood. And of course it can sustain the liver. For whatever reason, it appears to me that liver cancer loves to live on clean blood, on the red blood. While the blue blood, in other words, the blood that's going back to the heart to be oxygenated again, is the one that we can still use some sustenance for, sustenance from it and support, but it's not where the cancer is living. So when we embolize, in other words, we throw little pebbles of certain material to block the blood supply from the tumor, we are blocking the blood supply from the artery, from the clean blood, and we're still dependent on the blue blood to support the liver. This can be done in endless number of ways. We're not here to really compare them or talk about them. But if anything, you probably heard about chemo embolization, where chemotherapy is added to the embolization. You probably heard about the bland embolization, where this, if anything, there will be embolization with no chemotherapy. And you heard also probably about radioembolization, where there will be small radiation pebbles that will actually throw in to throw some radiation therapy. So with all of those, no doubt that patients will ultimately benefit. And if anything, they will uh, be getting that therapy, not necessarily only once, maybe it could be more than once, but they will have a great relationship with their doctors caring for that therapy. Now, sadly, at some point in time, this might not be enough. It could be still the disease is localized in the liver, or it could be that decided to go out of the liver. And please, please, again, a reminder, it does not mean this story is over, absolutely not. The perception that all of us always had whenever one of our colleagues in interventional radiology or in surgery say, oh, I'm going to send you to the cancer doctor, to the oncologist, the chemotherapy guy. Well, number one, we don't use chemotherapy for that disease. You're going to be blown away what we use for that disease. And number two is we're not really there, like just kind of like sitting and, you know, just waiting for people, God forbid, to die from disease. Absolutely not. We are here to contain and continue maintaining the disease as long as we can. And actually, the, as long as we can, can be pretty long. And if anything, it's nice to see now with the advent of that many therapies that patients can go from first line to second line to third line, even fourth line. It's really a reflection about how well we're doing with patients enough that they have a normal life. I always jokingly say in clinic, if a patient comes to me and start complaining that I'm probably like five minutes late, I'll say this means it's good. The fact that they have other things to worry about, it means that they're doing very well clinically. So what do we do for, uh, for, for therapy for liver cancer? As we said, chemotherapy is used, but not really in many places. Maybe in some part of the world, there's some data on it. We kind of do attempt it here and there, but really the priority is more different type of therapy. The first one of which is targeted therapy where we kind of like go after a specific target and we try to hurt the tumor so they can die. And you probably remember the drug that was first approved for that purpose called sorafenib. This was almost 12 years ago. Proudly where I am at Sloan Kettering, we did the first study on that. This was followed on by the Barcelona group to really prove that it does improve on survival. Interestingly, for 20 years or so, it's not like we're doing nothing. We were busy trying to enhance and advance on the sorafenib. Sadly, we could not. But if anything, it will be important to recognize that all the efforts are very genuine, extremely give a lot of credit for all the efforts that everybody has done. We were part of it as well. Teamwork was really a very solid component and nothing really happened for almost 10 years until the advent of more novel therapies. By that time, we recognize that could be other, again, targeted therapies of value, among which you probably heard about called lymvatinib. And then if anything, we start thinking in a different dimension at this point in time. And actually, uh, while I'm still talking about what we give as first-line treatment, we have sorafenib, we have lymvatinib, and we have a combination of immunotherapy plus one of those biologic agents, which is atezolizumab plus bevacizumab. 
And if anything, this really showed a tremendous improvement in outcome. And if anything, again, it could be available for uh, the patients who really are eligible for that. They need probably some further testing, but it's appropriate and it's appropriately okay to be done, but they definitely can benefit from that therapy as well. And actually look how timely it is. As actually today, today mentioned a little bit ago, incredible, literally exactly, and I'm a little bit excited about that, uh, exactly 10 hours ago, literally 10 hours ago at 2 a.m., well, many of you in the Eastern uh, time zone or probably 1 a.m. in the central, wherever you are, um, a announcement came out that another study, which is a combination of two immunotherapies together called dervalumab and tramilumumab is reported positive. This is how fast the information is happening. We proudly led that study from Sloan Kettering, and it was a large study, about 1,200 patients worldwide, and we're very delighted that just at 2 a.m., I kind of, you know, got the call, and the study is positive. It's incredible that this is how fast things are happening. So I think this is really but a message, not for despair, but to really be very positive about all what we can help with for getting patients in a better shape. Now, let's assume any of those therapies that already are approved, as we said, sorafenib, lenvatinib, atezolizumab plus bevizumab, and though hopefully we'll see once the data start coming out from what is 10 hours old only, which is the dorvalumab plus trimumab, let's assume now we're going to move to a second line treatment. They didn't work, did not tolerate it, whatever it is, we come to second line treatment. Again, we have a lot of choices, among which actually the first one that come to mind is cabozantinib. Cabozantinib is a very intriguing drug that again we proudly led from Sloan Kettering worldwide and if anything not only it was applicable and approved in second line but also in third line. Add to this we have rigorafenib which is again targeted therapy as well and we have remisurumab and on top of that we have also immunotherapy. One of them made it to be approved it's called pembrolizumab in second line and there is also a conditional approval still there for a combination called epilumab plus nivolumab. As you can see, the therapy choices are beyond endless. There's many of them that are there. And if anything, it will be appropriate to always have discussion with your doctors about what's needed. Now, as I delineated what can happen in the very early stage of the disease, when the disease is limited to deliver and we can really get rid of it, surgery, radiofrequency ablation, transplant. We spoke about local advanced disease, we talk about the different form embolization, chemoembolization, bland embolization, radioembolization. We also spoke ultimately about systemic therapy. And we said in first line, we have sorafenib, lymvatinib, atezolizumab plus bevizumab, and hopefully soon as 10 hours ago, we already heard that the positive study called the Himalaya study with dervalumab plus trimumab. In second line, we have cabozantinib, we have also rigorafenib, we have remisurumab, and also we have pembrolizumab, as well as ipilumab plus nivolumab. And then third line, as we said, we have cabozantinib. So now the question is, uh, and I'm sure many of you are asking, well, what about radiation? Absolutely. That's a very important thing. In the old days, we were very concerned about maybe if we radiate too much the liver, it might hurt. Actually, the technology is so advanced. A lot of our colleagues really have elaborated a lot of efforts to really make sure that radiation will apply. I would say still it's with the norm of a clinical trial. And I go back to what uh, Dr. Guy and Dr. Today just mentioned about the need for clinical trial. But nonetheless, yes, certain applicability for it might be visited and your doctors might talk about it. Now, another important concept that's really is to be brought up, which is rather very particular for liver cancer. It's a two-way street because I know very well, and remember, we are all physicians, we interact with all of you, and we know very well what kind of comes through our mind. Patient will come and say, well, uh, what stage is it? And with the idea that stage means that's it, this is what I get, or this is how we're long live. Absolutely not. Please, the staging is a good language for me to call Dr. Tede and discuss a patient. But remember, it's not necessarily an implication of really, that's the only implication of survival. Absolutely not. If anything, along that line, to remember that we think always that it's a one-way street from limited disease to more advanced disease to metastatic disease. But we always have learned that in liver cancer specific, it's a two-way street. We kind of always, and this is what I say to patients, 
everything remains on the table. We never say no to anything because you never know what you can get. With the advance and the further expansion of the use of those systemic therapies, we're seeing more and more of those positive outcomes, enough that can we, for example, invite a patient to get systemic therapy to now go with some local therapy because things are better and better controlled? Of course it can happen. So please always remember that it's a two-way street, but it's an important reminder. And thankfully, we're all very good at that in our specialties, different specialties, teamwork. As you heard from me in the beginning, I said we are a great team and we work all together, and absolutely we do. Because it has been shown, some nice work that was done by some of our colleagues have shown that a patient who are seen by more than one specialist, i.e. by surgery, transplant surgery, hepatology, gastroenterology, oncology, international radiology, um, radiation oncology, et cetera, will definitely fare better. And we should not ever forget about the need for supportive care because we know it's a big plate to kind of carry with having cancer. Psychosurgical support will be needed. Uh, the nurses and their support will be very critical and super important. And remember also your pharmacist will be very key in regard to that. Social work, and many other venue will be always available wherever you're being taken care of. Another important bring point, to bring point to bring in over here as well is how do we look at that disease? Understandably, we all kind of, you know, have the perception we need. We live all in a culture where, you know, yes, no, uh, up or down, higher or lower. And as such, we kind of end up really believing that if the CAT scan is showing or the MRI is showing that the tumor is smaller, that's great news. And this is all what I care about. Well, remember, the MRI and the CAT scan are only a representation of the body of the patient themselves. And as such, I always tell my trainees and my young doctors, please, please remember, the most important in all of this is interaction with the patients. So please make sure you see your doctor, make sure you come to the meetings at the same time, your doctors, by looking at you, they can really pull a lot of data, more than you can imagine, and be able to tell. And examining you is very important. Examining liver, touching liver, all of us have now high experience in regard to really how its liver is touched and what do you feel under and what really is what we like or what we don't like or we worry about. Within that context, it's very important then to understand that imaging, like CAT scan, MRI, is nothing more than a benchmark to just confirm to us what we know already clinically. So please don't live to the CAT scan, live your life. And if anything, the CAT scan and the MRI will be only to really confirm something. And then it comes to blood work. Blood work is needed because we like to make sure that your liver is safe and we're taking care of it. And also what we call alpha fetoprotein, which is a tumor marker, admittedly is not a confirmed tumor marker. Yes, we use it, we test it, we check it out, but it's not necessarily that we have to live by the number. It's not that if the number is high, it means bad, and if the number is low, it means good. Yes, it can, but not always that way, because there are many other reasons why the numbers can go high and low, and as such, we should not really interpret it only from one perspective. So as such, you can see that the story is way broader than simply a uh, CAT scan or a MRI. It's really more about the interaction with the doctor, the physical exam, the imaging, correct, add to the blood work to be able to build a co very uh, collective picture of all this information to, of course, better serve patient better. I would like to finish by wrapping up what I just spoke about endlessly. I've uh, been doing this for more than 20 years. And if anything, I remember very well when I started doing it. Sadly, we did not have any of those choices that I spoke and I kind of, you know, bombard you with all information about. And if anything, I remember, I used to tell patients go home and look where we are today. And please, please remember that this kind of, you know, effort, we have done all of it together. If anything, I can't thank more important than anybody else, the patient and their loved ones, because they entrusted us on what we really dealt with together. This is kind of like a story that started from nothing to where we are today. We moved from zero drugs to one drug, and now we are with eight drugs, Add to number nine and 10, as we just heard at 2 a.m. this morning, that will probably hopefully add to the planetarium of what we have for our patients. So please always have faith, always in trust that, you know, if you're doing well clinically, hopefully it will translate in you doing well. And please, please always 
keep in touch with your doctors, let them know. And by all means, we kind of are always there to help you out as a team. And we kind of, you know, always will do our best to kind of make sure that we continue to live with that cancer. So I'll stop here and I'll pass it back to Dr. Gray. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abuel, for that was incredible. I will uh, introduce, I'll ask Dr. Teddy to also come back on the screen. There we are, beautiful flowers and all. So what we'd like to do now is open up the Q&A to ask your questions. And we've been getting some great questions through the chat. So please feel free to continue to enter those in. Um, and I'll get started with what we have so far. So the first category of questions that's come up is, how does one keep their liver healthy? How can we prevent either progressive liver disease or liver disease to begin with? Or once we've been diagnosed with cirrhosis, what can we do to keep our livers healthy? And maybe Dr. Taddy, I'll start with you on that. So there is a lot you can do to keep your liver healthy. And ideally, we'd love to see more preventive medicine. Um, I think we live in a country that tends to focus uh, more on when people have fallen ill than on how to stay healthy. So uh, the number one and two drivers of liver disease really globally now are alcohol and being overweight. And those are entirely modifiable risk factors, which means that if you don't drink to excess, it's very unlikely you're going to hurt your liver. And if you uh, keep a lean, healthy lifestyle and make healthy food choices, it's highly unlikely you're going to develop obesity, diabetes, and, and the things that lead most commonly to fatty liver disease. I can't really stress that enough uh, because a lot of the habits that we make when we're younger and invincible and generally healthy come home to roost when we're older. So it's very important to think about your health overall along a continuum where longevity has now increased significantly. Um, and yet we have abundance. We have abundance of alcohol. We have abundance of food. Um, at least in this country, you can get alcohol anywhere. You can get food anywhere, usually pretty low quality food. Um, so think carefully about your habits and about the habits, not only that you have, but that you share with your children and your families, because you set an example by how you live your life. And families that engage in physical activity, uh, that put health and wellness um, you know, at front and center of really living a holistic life, those are habits you instill uh, in the next generation. And we are in dire need of that in this country. So that's really the bottom line um, in terms of you know, what to do preventively. But hepatitis C can be cured now. So if you've never been tested, you should be tested, anybody 18 and over, and get treated if you have hepatitis C because you'll cure the virus, reduce your chances of developing cirrhosis, and vastly reduce any chances of developing cancer. Hepatitis B is a virus that's endemic in a lot of other parts of the world and certainly on the coasts in the United States. Um, you should be tested, and there's legislation going forward actually looking for a one-time hepatitis B testing in all people over 18. Uh, there are antivirals for hepatitis B. There are no cures yet, but I think there will be soon. And we can keep the virus at bay if needed. A lot of people have a sort of tolerance to hepatitis B. So um, it's important to understand your risk factors that may underlie liver disease. Um, so those are the most important things that, at keeping your liver healthy. If you have cirrhosis, actually, you can stay healthy for a period of, of time, usually oftentimes through the end of your life, by removing whatever it is that, that caused the cirrhosis if you can remove it. So for example, if you have alcohol-related cirrhosis, you stop drinking, your liver gets a second wind. Oftentimes people with compensated alcoholic cirrhosis can live for decades if they stop drinking, okay? So that type of, of sort of, do, do you have something that can be treated or removed that will prevent the progression of liver disease is really the conversation you should be having about um, keeping your liver healthy, whether you have no liver disease at all, or whether you, you know, have cirrhosis. And just remember that prevention um, is wonderful. And we as a country really need to think about these things uh, from a population health standpoint. That is very well said, completely agree. And two follow-up questions that come from that. The first is, are there specific tests that patients should be speaking with their doctor about to assess the health of the liver? So liver tests are often done at periodic points in a person's life when they're getting routine clinical care. 
Um, so oftentimes uh, liver tests will be checked uh, by your primary care physician. Uh, for example, um, oftentimes around the time they check cholesterol, um, around the time they might be thinking about uh, prescribing a drug, for example. Um, it's really important to know though that liver disease per se is silent, okay? People usually don't have symptoms of liver disease until their liver is very sick. So you really need to think about your family history. If you have family history of liver disease, you definitely wanna bring that up with your doctor. If you're engaging in behaviors that may have exposed you to hepatitis C or B, or if you've never been tested for those and you're an adult, you should certainly talk to your doctor about that. Um, and really, if you struggle with um, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, or uh, diabetes, or a combination of the above, it is important to consider liver disease um, because oftentimes people are very worried about getting cholesterol levels down or thinking about heart disease. And we have very good medications and tests for that, but the liver disease is kind of like an afterthought, right? So those conversations have to be had. Um, and I think one of our jobs as specialists in this field is to really bring awareness to primary care doctors on just how prevalent liver disease is and when to think about it in the course of your sort of well adult visits. Um, but it is really important to, to have a visit, right? So, you know, I, I, it always amazes me that we care so much about our children's well child visits and their vaccination records. And we have all kinds of ways of keeping track of that. And the minute we're adults, we're like, yeah, whatever, right? And that's a really bad example to set for your kids. Like the minute they turn 18, hey, forget it. You got all your vaccines, don't worry about it anymore. We really need care through all of the stages of our lives, right? Because we have a lot of changes that happen as we get older. And we also you know, change our behaviors as we get older. And so it's really important to seek periodic medical care, to also understand that you need vaccines through your adulthood too. So it doesn't stop. You know, it's, it's not like mom and dad say, okay, you're fine. And then you never have to worry about your health anymore. And actually what's really important is to set the example for your kids. So I think we all have a relative who probably was diagnosed with a cancer very late in life. And it was like, oh yeah, they, they hadn't gone to the doctor in 30 years. And by the time they went, they were just so far gone. They were exhausted, lost weight, et cetera. That should never be the case. You know, primary care and preventive medicine will keep you well. And so those are the things that you really need to engage in. And the conversation about liver disease should certainly be spurred on if you have a family history of liver disease, if there are abnormalities in routine liver tests that can be, as I said, checked periodically. Um, so do keep your doctors informed, but most importantly, go to the doctor. I think that really emphasizes something we're all trying to hammer home today, which is like, this is a team, not only a team amongst providers, but a team amongst patients and providers. And so really advocating for yourself, going to the doctor, asking your questions. And the simple question is, have we checked my liver? Is it healthy? Is a really great way to start. Um, so I, I think that that's something that hopefully everyone's going to take away today. Uh, another question that came up along these lines is the question of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and whether there is an increased risk of cancer, even when those patients don't have cirrhosis. And then how do we deal with the screening around that? Um, do you have a thought on that? That's a very tough area because um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is so highly prevalent. Um, and it's still, if you look at the people who do develop liver cancer without cirrhosis, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction. So at this point, it doesn't justify saying, okay, we're gonna screen everybody with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease without cirrhosis for liver cancer. The real question is where do we move the field forward in terms of biomarkers? Who are those people, right? We just don't have enough data yet to be able to pick those people out. And I think the more we learn about liver cancer, the more we learn about biomarkers and um, things that we can detect in blood and on, and, you know, and tissue, the closer we'll get there. And even on imaging, we learn a lot from imaging as well. So we're not really um, able to say that people without cirrhosis in the setting of fatty liver disease should be getting screening. But I think it's also really important to remember that fatty liver disease is actually one of the most modifiable uh, reasons for developing cirrhosis. So if you can actually modify behaviors, which I know is a lot easier said than done, 
you know, you may actually prevent the progression of scarring to cirrhosis to cancer. And know also that it's, it's really important to know that not everybody with cirrhosis gets liver cancer, okay? It's a risk for developing liver cancer, but cirrhosis in and of itself is not A, a death sentence, or B, an absolute that you're gonna get liver cancer. So all of these things, we need to have more data to understand who are those people who will develop cirrhosis if they have fatty liver disease. Who are the people with cirrhosis who will develop liver cancer? So that's where the field needs to move in order for us to do good risk prediction and to have good biomarkers that can inform how we take care of populations. I think that's an important thing. And, and just to remember in terms of quoting a risk for liver cancer within cirrhosis, it, it's dependent, but for one of the, the quotes would be about 3% per year of people who have cirrhosis will go on to develop liver cancer. So that's just something to remind ourselves of. The risk is low, but it's not zero. And when we find things early, we can apply all these various therapies that Dr. Abu Alpha mentioned. And so that's why it's important to stay ahead of the game here, both by preventing the progression of cirrhosis by modifying the risk factors, like for example, alcohol or fatty liver, but also once we're there, then continue to stay on top of things. So excellent. Uh, the next thing where we wanna to move to is treatment. So one question for you, Dr. Abelf, is what things can patients be doing to get ready for treatment? Are there things, we've kind of talked a lot about behavioral modification, but is there anything specific patients can be doing on their way to getting treatment? Uh, thanks so much for whoever asked this question. This is a very critical one. And uh, if anything, uh, again, as I mentioned when I was uh, kind of debriefing on all the treatments, uh, please, please remember, this is not the knee jerk kind of, you know, reaction. It's not like I have this, I do that. Uh, pause, uh, make sure that you take your time to really understand better. And if anything, you will notice that uh, understandably, uh, a patient will come, I have liver cancer, I wanna fix it right now. And remember please in the complexity that you are already appreciating from your experience and what you're hearing from us of the disease, you don't want ever to go on the next step until you know that the step that you are on is very firm and solid. For example, did I do the right imaging? Did I complete all the appropriate blood work? Did I do all the testing needed for risk factors as we heard from Dr. Day? In regard to other things, did I need a biopsy? Was it done correctly? Did I get the right tissue? Was it done for genetic testing, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of steps that might not necessarily imply that I have this, I'm gonna do that tomorrow. It might take a little bit of time until do that. Now, along that line, it's very important to remember that the time frame that we live within is not the one that the same time frame that the cancer live within. In other words, for us, a minute is a minute. But for the cancer, a minute is way longer than we think, because sadly, the reality is, for example, for a hepatitis C patient, the cancer evolve over 10 to 30 years. It doesn't happen just overnight. So as such, anything that your doctor will tell you to do and you say, well, but wait a minute, it's going to grow in that week while I'm waiting. Absolutely not. It really... Uh, Preferable, of course, if we can do everything right away, because of course we'll all feel better. But the uh, reasonableness of what the physicians might ask you to do, and it might take that week or so, it's not the end of the world. It's okay to just be patient that regard. So the other component that I'd like to ask uh, to talk about in regard to this first preparation, come engaged to the physician. Uh, there are kind of two perspectives that can be brought into this. I number one come and I don't know, and I care less, and I'm upset. That's fair, you might be upset. But please, in that setting, always don't ever come on yourself. Four eyes, four ears is better than two and two. And if anything, please always bring your family member, your loved ones, your friend. Um, I always jokingly, I tell my patients, uh, oh, who, who is this? Oh, this is so-and-so. Oh, uh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a nurse. And I told them always, I'm so happy you're here because I never saw a patient to bring, for example, their real estate agent. They always bring somebody who is in healthcare. So always you have connection, you have friends, please don't feel like, oh my God, the doctors might not be happy if I bring my doctor, my friend who's a doctor or my friend who's a nurse. Absolutely not. Actually, they are our colleagues. We like them too, because they now smartly you bring the right person because they can read both languages. They are your friend, they are a colleague, they are your family member, and also they understand the medical language. So they can be very important to really connect. But please don't ever go to your doctor on your own. On the other hand, please, it's very important, don't come with the quizzing mode. 
In other words, I'm going to come and I'm going to quiz everything and I'm going to question that. Don't worry. It's not like we don't know and it's not that we're scared of it. But please, rather engage in a teamwork perspective. In other words, rather than saying, uh, how much do you do this? Or when do you do that? And for example, jokingly, somebody by 10 a.m. asked me, for example, how many times you have seen this? I'll tell them, you mean today? And because, you know, we're all kind of like really immersed our life into this. So please come as a team member. Don't come as being like, okay, we're going to quiz that doctor. In general, people will tell you humbly and very appropriately, if I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. And if anything, I'll connect you with the expert that we will really will help better in that regard, or I'll get them on the phone or what have we. So come with your questions, but really more for your perspective. Don't come to quiz the doctor, come to quiz the disease. It's very important to build that kind of, you know, collegial relationship and this kind of teamwork bonding right from the start. And you won't believe it how much you'll go far long with a doctor in regard to do everything. Because I can assure you, we're all humans as well. We really care. You should see how many times I will probably pause in the middle of the uh, clinic. And some patients probably, if they are listening, they will know that about me. I would say, forgive me, I'll be back in a second. And the first thing, I might just go for a second, and I'm not kidding. I'll be standing in the hallway, and I'm taking a deep breath, because the important next part of the discussion is going to be very critical, and I'm prepping myself mentally to make sure I work as a team. So please be assured, we'll do everything we can, even out of our way, to make sure that we are here to help you and serve you everything we can. Wonderful, thank you. So other questions about therapy include, um, can surgery be used for liver cancer treatment? Maybe speaking a bit about resection as an option. And I'm sorry, I didn't uh, get the, the first part of the question. Can what uh, be- Can resection, uh -huh. surgical resection of for the sure. cancer be used? When is that applied? Yeah, yeah, so, so thanks so much again uh, for the question. And as we refer to, in general, if the cancer is limited to the liver itself, and at the same time, not involving the blood vessels that really feed into the liver. In general, it can be taken out. Uh, there could be a little bit of discussion about if it's taken out or not based on the liver function. Because as we spoke, if the liver function is not that good, you don't want to have it taken out because it might actually, whatever you take out of the liver, it will kind of, you lose on liver function. And this is where transplant comes into play. And so, in other words, we have resection, we have radio frequency ablation for smaller lesions, but at the same time, we have transplant in case the liver function is not good. So again, if you're not sure, it's a good idea to ask your doctor and they will refer you if appropriately so. And this is where the team approach is so important. As a liver doctor myself, I'm always assessing how strong is a patient's under, underlying liver to determine if they could tolerate having a piece of it removed. And if not, then we're talking about, for example, transplant or other potential therapies. And just a, a, a clarification from something that came into the, the chat. One of the questions was, can ablative therapy in a severely scarred liver be used preventatively? And no, that is not something that we, um, we do preventatively. Um, so we'll move along there to the next question is um, maybe a, a bit of a review again about available treatments for metastatic liver cancer. So let's define again for the group, what is metastatic liver cancer and then how do we approach it from the, the first line and then potentially the second line, just in some bullet points. Sure. By all means, actually, it's a little bit not uh, kind of like a clear cut between what's metastatic, what's not, because we have to remember that even locally advanced disease in the liver, at some point, there could be a limit to much how much the local therapy can do. In other words, don't be surprised. Sometimes your doctor might say, you know what, we're going to apply systemic therapy, or I'm going to refer you to the oncologist to do systemic therapy, because I don't think, for example, the local therapy is helpful anymore. So it's really transitional component in the pass on from the local to the systemic therapy. With this said, systemic therapy will imply that the cancer, either it's beyond the control area of where it is in the liver, including, for example, extensive lymph nodes. And we already are, have known, and we published that, the four organs that mostly where cancer of the liver can go, include the lung, include the lymph nodes, include the adrenal glands, and also include the bone. And so your doctor will look everywhere, will definitely depend a lot on you expelling, exp expressing any symptoms per se, and will do whatever necessary to conform that the disease is there or not. And accordingly, will apply the systemic therapy. Uh, and I don't know, maybe I'll stop here because probably we'll get another question on the, the systemic therapy details or would like to go on. 
I think maybe uh, the specific question also asks, what are the available treatments for metastatic uh, liver cancer? So maybe just continuing to talk about those therapies a bit again. No, that's a great continuation of what we just spoke about. And uh, if anything, as we said, systemic therapy is very extensive at the moment. In first line, so far, we have three options, including, as we said, sorafenib, lymvatinib, and atezolizumab plus bevacizumab. And as we just said, as of 10 hours ago, there is at least positive data on a new combination called darvalumab plus tremelumab, but we are waiting for seeing the data and see how it's going to come, hopefully become another standard of care. Add to this, in second line therapy, we have cabozantinib, rigorafenib, ramisurumab, and we have also atezolizumab, and sorry, pembrolizumab, and also uh, ipilumab plus nivolumab. And then in third line, we have cabozantinib. Uh, I know it's a little bit too much of uh, kind of uh, uh, fancy words, make us look smart. But <laughs> at the end of the day, uh, be assured if you want to remember them in a practical way, targeted therapy or what we say kind of pills because they are mostly pills, uh, except for one of them. And number two is immunotherapy. And we have noticed that immunotherapy plus targeted therapy fare better than targeted therapy by itself. And now the new thing that I do just heard 10 hours ago at 2 a.m. in the morning in Eastern time is immunotherapy plus immunotherapy can make a big difference. So that's really what we're waiting for more details on. And I, I wanna clarify what immunotherapy is and I'm gonna quote a, a colleague and good friend, Dr. Katie Kelly from UCSF. And she talks about how cancer cells are like Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. And that's one of the reasons why cancer cells can grow is because the immune system itself typically does not see the cancer cells. And what immunotherapy does is it takes off the invisibility cloak such that now the immune system can see the abnormal cancer cells and then attack those cancer cells. So that's one of the things that has really revolutionized cancer therapy in general and has really helped make such a difference in liver cancer in specific. Um, excellent. So the, the next question I have is, um, from the group is, can we talk a little bit about cell therapy? Is cell therapy something that we're looking into with liver cancer? Yeah, thanks so much. Actually, I saw that uh, question in the chat and I'm so happy I was waiting for it. <laughs> so, so if anything, a great uh, question. Uh, cell therapy implies by definition, what we are trying to do is make the immune cells in our body, not only see the cancer, but even smell it. And then others can go after it and even get rid of it altogether. That kind of approach, what we call CAR-T therapy, has already been approved for two types of lymphoma. At the moment, there's a lot of interest in regard to cell therapy coming to the treatment of different solid tumors, among which, of course, liver cancer. So there has been some clinical trials. Some of them have been happening here and there in the US. And if anything, uh, the challenge become, uh, remains two. Number one, are we checking the appropriate antigen? In other words, are we going after the specific target where we can attack those cells? And number two, how safe is it? Because we are really launching the immune system in a different way. Uh, so these kind of efforts are still happening worldwide. And we proudly, many of us, I know UCSF where that guy is and ourselves at Sloan Kettering are really keep lead on it. And if anything, at the moment, we are really have a lot of efforts happening literally worldwide uh, that were leading from here from Sloan Catering that trying to identify that antigen and with the aim to hopefully have some CAR T cell therapy for our patients soon. So yes, this is a novel thing. Whoever asked the question, you are absolutely right. This is really where we're gonna go to the next level in regard to even get better outcome for patients that hopefully will even translate into cure. 20 years ago, for me to say cure in mistake disease was probably, was not right. But today, can I say it? It can be one day we might see that. I would say definitely we have more information on our hand that yes, we can optimistically think that way. And of course, we look forward to see that happening in our lifetime. Beautiful, beautiful. So we have just a few more minutes and a question just came into the chat that says, um, with, liver, with liver cancer patients with hepatitis C since childhood, should they undergo viral therapy? So I think there's two questions here. One is hepatitis C independent of liver cancer? Should it be treated? And then how do we approach hepatitis C treatment in those with liver cancer? So 
you wanna? I, th I thought maybe uh, Tamar, you wanna talk about the H hepatitis C treatment without cancer, and then I'll touch on the cancer part. This is what I yeah, thought. Yeah, that that would be great. Uh, great. Um, so I do think it's very important that people understand unequivocally we have a cure for hepatitis C. Okay, so you should get your hepatitis C cured if you have it. If you haven't been tested, you should get tested for it. Um, children are tested if their parents have hepatitis C um, quite often. Um, and that's another sort of historical thing. You know, if your mother had hepatitis C, you should tell your provider that if you hadn't been tested, for example. Um, and then, you know, now that we have really a bona fide cure in like 98% of patients, and these are all pills, there are no injectables, it's taken for anywhere from six to 12 weeks um, with the durable cure, meaning you don't have that virus in your body anymore. There is absolutely no reason not to get treated. So I'll stop there and then we can talk about the nuance of treating with cancer. Yeah, no, by all means. And uh, absolutely, this is, uh, please remember for everybody, we're proud and we're delighted to know that the Nobel Prize for medicine last year was for this. And I'll tell you, it's so humbling that actually, you know, one of the Nobel laureates is actually our neighbor here at Rockefeller University, and we work together quite a bit. And it's really very touching to kind of like see this set close to home happening. So by all means, this was great news. At the same time, of course, the next question is, patients who have liver cancer already, will we treat or not? Sadly, in that reality, the cat is out of the bag already. And in other words, the damage in the liver already is there. So really we don't have full evidence that treating the cancer, uh, correction, treating the virus is gonna make any difference in regard to the cancer. But nonetheless, I would say that this is a work of effort that's still ongoing. And if anything, again, to go back to the teamwork perspective, I would say this is where the oncologist and the hepatologists need to talk to each other and try to kind of guide the patient accordingly in regard to the applicability. Because remember what I mentioned beforehand, can we have scenarios where, for example, we have a complete response to therapy? Of course it can happen. And if this is the case, can we then, for example, tackle the uh, virus itself? Of course we can think of, but we have to really think a little bit carefully in regard to the assessment and not to think about those two things as independent. Well, I'll deal with this with the cancer doctor and I'll deal with that with the hepatitis doctor. Absolutely not. They are really a teamwork that should be involved in that regard because the data is not fully fledged in regard to treatment of a patient with liver cancer, with hepatitis C treatment at this point in time. Uh, we really don't have a full understanding of that. So it's not yet the recommendation per se. And I think there's an important uh, clarifier here, which is the data is ongoing to understand about hepatitis C, but it's very clear in hepatitis B that patients who have cirrhosis should be treated for hepatitis B, and patients who have liver cancer, they should be treated with hepatitis B. So different viruses, different approaches, but in case there are different members in the audience, I want to make sure that that's stated. So we're wrapping up our time here, and I wanted to say that there are a few more questions in the chat that I think we'll get to later in the other sessions. One is, what are the most promising targets for liver cancer treatment? We talked about it. Maybe we'll stop, talk about that again when we talk about navigating clinical trials. And then what are some side effects of treatment? And because each treatment is different, side effect profiles may be different. So we perhaps might get to that later. Um, but always a really good question to ask your physicians. When you are deciding on a treatment plan with both your physicians and your family members, you know, what are the risks and benefits of that treatment? How can I expect to feel? Are, and how likely it is to work, those are really important questions to have laid out on the table right away. So please, again, feel free to advocate for yourself because we're ready and willing to be there with you on that. So it is my pleasure to continue our programming with the introduction of Dr. Verma. Dr. Verma is a prominent researcher in the field of patient-centered outcomes at Einstein Health Network. Um, she is also the director of research for the Department of Transplant there. She holds government-funded NIH uh, grants, and she conducts research in improving patient-centered care, uh, including how to use telemedicine, how to integrate palliative care services, and, and thinking about behavioral health in routine medical care. So thank you, Dr. Verma, for speaking to us today about how to navigate clinical trials. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Dr. Guy, for a nice introduction. Um, and, and I'm glad to be here to just discuss like very clearly what clinical trials are, uh, why we do research, what the patients benefit from research, and how you can contribute uh, to improvement in medicine. 
Um, any questions, you can stop me in the middle or write it in the chat, whatever is convenient to you. So I'll just go over um, kind of my thinking of why we are doing clinical trials and what kind of research um, can be done in order to improve health outcomes and even our own understanding in, within medicine as to what are the treatment options, um, what are the diagnostic options. So there are different types of uh, clinical trials which run. So I, I just wanted to say that, I mean, trials are the best way to test um, whether a treatment is better than treatment, than another treatment or no treatment. Um, and also even diagnostic tests, screening tests, whether a test can identify the same issue at a little earlier stage, at a lower cost, um, being less invasive than others which can be exposed to radiations or imaging uh, costs and so forth. Um, interventions for preventing or treating health problems are always examined in a safe and efficient way. And that's why the clinical trials follow a very controlled format where the researchers have to first design the research question very um, scientifically, thoughtfully, and carefully uh, to make sure everything is clear as to what you want to accomplish during the as a part of the trial and what are the possible benefits and the possible risks to the patients who might participate in future. So as a patient, you know, you might be considering enrolling in a trial or your physician might be approaching you uh, to participate in a clinical trial. So if you are interested um, in existing or newer treatments, you will also be proactive. Some patients kind of participate or identify clinical trials by themselves by going onto the websites um, of clinicaltrials.gov or even um, our individual kind of hospitals have websites which display the ongoing trials for patients' ease and convenience convenience to understand. Um, however, before any new drug treatment can be tested in clinical trials, I want to just let you all know that it goes through some lab testing so that the safety um, in non-humans is established most of the times before it is even um, given any approval to undergo testing with um, clinical patients or even healthy volunteers to begin with. New treatments um, need to be evaluated statistically. So this is kind of a scientific term where, which is very commonly used in clinical trials is statistical evaluation and how many patients do you enroll to reach that level of um, evaluation or assessment so that the results of the trial have some impact on future medicine. Um, that means the like there is an entire expert group of statisticians who would run different types of analysis to really identify how many patients do we need to enroll to prove what we want to prove or even to disprove what we are hoping is actually true. So there are different ways when uh, which are uh, used to conduct these analysis to inform the clinical trials and this all thinking or scientific discussion happens before a trial is launched. Um, so it, it makes it a very informed decision. And also wanted to let you know that all the government bodies regulate the uh, processes of clinical trials. Um, above us, like outside the institution, most of the federal governing organizations um, also oversee the conduct of clinical trials. And within each institution, there is an institutional review board which reviews and approves each and every document which is going to be shared with the patient and each and every process which is going to be uh, proposed um, to the patient as a part of the clinical trial. So this all detail runs into a document which is called a protocol. So the, so the protocol really outlines the details of the background of why we want to do this kind of research, what we will do as a part of this research and what we want to accomplish. So uh, for patients, some of, sometimes who are very much interested, they are able to kind of get access to these protocols through different um, scenarios or situations and read through the details. And the, and, and the thing is that the results must be um, reviewed systematically and carefully analyzed to inform medicine. So clinical trials usually aim to enhance um, or new or existing treatments and diagnostic strategies. Um, and there are several reasons which can um, you would say improve your understanding and, and interest to participate, whereas some people do not want to participate. The participation is completely voluntary um, and whatever decisions you made are very personal um, and will not impact your routine clinical care. That is 100% like at each and every clinical center that participation in clinical trials, accepting or declining, is not going to impact your um, clinical management decision-making. 
However, there are some benefits and there are some risks, of course, involved in any new kind of participation. Most of the times patients want to have um, access to newer treatments. Um, for example, long time ago when we were doing hepatitis C trials, there, was, there were limited treatment options um, and participating in, this, in these kinds of trials had um, given them an opportunity to gain access to some newer treatments which have now become standard of care. Um, those newer treatments at that time were under testing phase to even have their safety assessment. But as a part of these trials, they were able to access these treatments, um, undergo the cure, and be a part of this um, whole movement towards curing hepatitis C by 2020. So, and, and sometimes patients also want to contribute to improvement and understanding of medicine. So that is one of the kind of things which I have seen most of the time prompts patients to participate in some of the observational trials. For example, I'm going to share, um, currently we are doing a study in which we are enrolling patients with HCC for diagnostic um, testing. So there are certain tests which can be used to do an early detection versus late detection and avoid imaging costs. Um, so those tests are still under development phase. So those kinds of tests are, are being uh, offered to patients with cirrhosis who are at the high risk of developing HCC over time. So, so we are enrolling patients into that trial. Um, there were a, a few other trials related to HCC and NASH, again, talking about um, observation and development of tests, which can help us uh, detect the disease at an early stage so that we can have explore different treatment options. So most of the trials are controlled, which I mean to say is they provide, um, there are usually two groups of patients. One is the test arm, one is the control arm. So the test arm is the one which is getting the intervention or getting the test, and the control arm is the one which may not be getting the intervention or maybe getting a placebo. Placebo is a dummy pill or, or a test which does not really detect what they are hoping to detect. So there are, there are options. And most of the times these trials are listed as randomized control trials. So this is again a clinical term or a scientific term is randomization is, which is like flipping off a coin. So in that way, either there is a 50% there is chance if there are two groups, there are 50% chance that you will get randomized to the intervention arm or to the control arm. But this kind of uh, where you will end up will be determined once you sign the informed consent. So this takes me to the next point, which I wanted to bring to your attention is um, that all the clinical trials have an informed consent document um, where the study coordinator and the study principal investigator and staff um, are there to explain each and every detail um, about the study to you before you decide to participate or to not participate. So the informed consent is a kind of a legal document which is approved and reviewed by the Institutional Review Board um, and which makes sure that all the study details are listed clearly um, in, in, in kind of not medical language but clear terms which makes a normal person understand what we are trying to accomplish, what they are committing to, how many visits they need to test, how many additional tests that they will need to get, if there are any additional costs or, or there are additional benefits or incentives as a part of uh, participation. Into the, uh, into the clinical trials. Um, so, so I wanted to say that this informed consent document um, is something important, which you, in case you want to participate in a trial, which you must pay attention to um, and read through carefully, ask any questions, take your own time um, so that you have a clear understanding of what you are um, committing to. Uh, so, so informed consent, it kind of gives all the important information of whether you want to enroll or you want, or you do not want to enroll including the risks of uh, participation or benefits of participation. Um, and you have still the responsibility to decline or accept. Um, and most of the clinical trials, almost all of them, you can decline to participate anytime you want. It is a voluntary participation. Um, and all these studies are under strict um, quality control to make sure um, the Institutional Review Board uh, reviews whatever the study is doing over the year during their annual reviews um, and kind of lists everything out very clearly, how many patients are enrolled. Um, and should there be any adverse event um, related to a treatment or to any of the study processes, uh, we as researchers are required to report it to our higher authorities so that they can make within like 24 to 48 hours so that they can make an informed decision of whether to continue the trial or, or not. So most of the times adverse events we have seen in the past are never serious. 
Um, they can be, again, in certain trials, they can be, but the kind of research we have been doing at Einstein has been on, on a very safer side, we only select protocols to begin with, which are which we all consider are um, to be in patient safety side, which is our first, you know, uh, first kind of logo. Our, our team really kind of cares for patient safety and patient-centered approaches. So we want to make sure whatever we are doing is according to your needs and according to your expectations. Um, so all our research is well controlled. It is all safe to participate. Um, but again, the, there are additional risks and benefits for each individual study. And um, our coordinators and the study investigators are always there to clearly explain, answer all your questions before you make the full informed decision. I'll stop here. And if there are any questions, um, we'd be happy to further on the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Burma. That was wonderful. So there are some questions coming in. So the first question that came in was, what if a patient decides to change their mind after they've enrolled in a clinical trial? What happens in that instance? Um, so that's a wonderful question. You know, decisions always change. I change my mind every minute. You're like, everybody is a human being. So we completely understand that. And whenever you change your mind, um, I strongly recommend you have a discussion with the study coordinator and the study principal investigator, since they are always there to support you and help you make a better decision. If you do decide that you do not want to participate, it's completely voluntary. You can stop at any time. And there are probably some protocol uh, kind of changes or, or you would say steps which are always written that should the patient decide to withdraw from the study, we will do A, B, and C to complete the study. So that in that, in that way, your data which has already been collected is still um, used within the study processes and everything is um, done according to the protocol. Uh, and even the informed consent, you know, always has um, a section where, where it clearly outlines to begin with, should you decide to withdraw in the study during the participation, it's up to you, but at the end of the study, we will do A, B, and C. Most of the times, those A, B, and Cs are usually a lab test, just to make sure that you are not withdrawing for any adverse events, because if there is any adverse event, we want to learn from that episode. We want to make sure our further patients are not impacted. So our clinical team is always there to assist and understand that whatever things happen, I mean, you may might get pain or a rash or was it allergic or was it related to the study intervention? So we want to make sure that point is very clear that if you are withdrawing for any safety issues, we want to take that higher up so that our future patients um, understand and learn from that. And we learn from that to make sure it's not, it is not a safety issue that you are withdrawing. But personal decisions, it's like lack of time, getting a new job. I have heard people moving out of state so they cannot come in. Um, again, limited time, have got a child at home. My mother went home. So most of the times we have had um, reasons like that to decline that I just do not have the time for additional study visits. Uh, but, but all the decision remains up to you. You may you remain the decision maker and our center point. Uh, we, our team is always here to just support. Wonderful. And I think that that is a good segue in this idea of the, the patient really being central to, again, the partnership around clinical trials. And one thing just to remind patients of is that people who run clinical trials, we take this very seriously. And so the team is usually quite dialed in. And, and so I think you know, advocating for what you need as part of the, the consent, understanding uh, questions, asking them is really helpful, but the team is really dedicated into making this a successful venture for you as well as for um, the science. So I want to just point that out. Um, the, the other question that has come up is, um, what kind, like, what is the risk, for example, of joining a clinical trial? What's the drawback? Mm -hmm. So the risks is most of the times we have seen for newer intervention trials or treatment trials where patients do have additional risks. Um, I'm going to take an example of hep C and I'm going to take an example of our NASH patients. So for example, for hepatitis C, early on, the treatments had large amount of side effects. For example, the interferon therapy, which was, um, which was leading to many other complications, um, so the, the risks were related to that treatment, which was a part of standard of care, but the newer treatments had lesser risks, but they had different risks. So, right, some people got more fatigue because of the newer treatment or their pruritus did not improve at all because of the newer treatment or came on as a new side effect. 
So all these risks are most of the times listed clearly in the informed consent. Um, most of the times these risks are very negligible, but they occur. You know, it's like one in 100,000 patients had this episode and even blood draw, there is like one in 20 patients. We did have one of, I mean, you know, liver disease patients, we bleed more. Um, so the blood draw can have some other consequences. And if there is more blood draw, of course you feel like fainting and other things. So all these additional risks are always explained in the consent form. Um, any new treatment trials um, do come with additional risks or different risks than the current standard of care. Um, but I feel sometimes um, the benefits outweigh the risks. That's the decision which you as a patient have to make along with the, your information from the care, patient care team. Um, again, the team at Einstein is always willing to help understand um, what are the potential risks. We are very clear with that and what are the potential benefits. For example, for NASH patients, there is no true treatment option as of now. Most of the drugs which are being tested are under testing phase. So, um, so I feel that there are options where your liver um, fibrosis may improve by using these new treatments, but we don't know yet. We are hoping to learn from those studies, but there are, there are chances that those new additional um, medications may have some drug-induced liver injury effects. So that's kind of a part of our serious adverse event or recording reports. So all these things make um, an impact, but, uh, but and there are like observational trials, I'll just echo again before, where you just kind of participate, you get some blood draw, and it is going to help improve future patients. So the risk for that time kind of study is just getting an additional blood draw, which you normally get anyways. So if there are very individualized risks, uh, but you need to be informed. So I would highly encourage to make that very clear with the study coordinator and with the principal investigator staff team but what are my risks to participate in the study so you have an informed discussion with them. Wonderful. And a question came up that navigating the clinical trials website can be challenging for patients. And we're wondering, do you have any suggestions and tips how to make that easier or other places to look? Um, yeah, I know. I mean, clinical trials website has like millions of trials onto it from all over the world, not only in the U.S., but sometimes people from outside who are working with the U.S. sites also have to register that. Um, I think the good part is there is a search engine where you can type in liver disease. So at least out of those millions of records, it's going to pull out those 5,000 records with liver disease. If you want to be more specific, you can type in liver cancer and treatment. So it's just kind of search strategies which can help. But Einstein has a website on clinical trials uh, within our main homepage, which I can circulate to Ivory and then she can put it on the link um, where we kind of uh, update it every six months. Any active clinical trials go onto the website. So the patients and caregivers um, can take a look and potentially see if they can be candidates. And then it lists the name of our study coordinator, their contact phone number, email. So you can contact them directly as well but no better suggestions i'm sorry <laughs> well i think that that's a good a reminder is that oftentimes you know medical care starts locally and so you go to the website of wherever it is you're getting your care for and you type in you know liver cancer trials at x center uh, and then you can start to get an overview all the centers who are doing clinical trials do have a website where they're talking about what they have available if it's open if it's closed and then bringing that data printing it out or writing it down and bringing it to your clinician and saying hey you know have you thought about these clinical trials for me am i a candidate or not because as dr tady had mentioned in our multidisciplinary tumor boards where we're reviewing patients, we're asking ourselves, is there a clinical trial that would be the right thing for consideration for this patient? So we're thinking about it on the provider back end, and that's another way for you to advocate on the front end. Um, I think what we're going to do is move along here, um, but I wanted to point out that there are a few more um, questions in, um, in the chat that, that I wanted to say. Um, the first is that there's a question about uh, COVID vaccines and liver cancer, and we're going to have um, Dr. Hamid speaking to about that, speaking to that in just a, a little while. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, and then the the second question um, is, and I don't know if you can maybe speak to this, um, given that there are clinical trials around this, is that you know Dr. Teddy had mentioned about that we're working toward a cure for hepatitis B. We don't have one. We have one for hepatitis C, but not for hepatitis B, and that there are some 
clinical trials around this in terms of at least early phase? And, and can you discuss anything about that for the, for the patients? Uh, yeah, so for hepatitis B, again, just like hep C, this is the way to go. But it took at least a decade for the hep C cure to be in the market and now being freely available and, and making us all as providers proud that yes, 100% of hep C is curable. Uh, for hepatitis B, the studies are under progress. They're collecting data and they're enrolling patients actively. So nothing has been analyzed or published much um, in the field, which I'm familiar of. Um, but I think we are li literally looking forward to what the outcomes would be in the next time to come. So should you have HEP-B and you're interested, again, looking through the website for HEP-B trials would be the way to go. Great, thank you. Um, and just as a, a summary for this part of clinical trials and, and going back to what Dr. Abba Alpha was saying in terms of liver cancer, you know, when he started this 20 years ago, he, he noticed that we didn't have very many therapies for liver cancer. And it was through the work of clinical trials that we are where we are today with yet another published a trial as of today. So I think it's a reminder that though there are complexities around thinking about if you would like to be part of a clinical trial, there are some huge benefits, not only potentially to yourself, but to the overall community of people who are struggling with liver disease and liver cancer. Um, so that's just something to be reminded of is it really does help us move the field forward. And as Dr. Kitty said, we are rapidly changing in liver cancer. And so clinical trials are a really important part of that work. So thank you, Dr. Verma, for your work in clinical trials. And I'm going to move forward again. Um, and we're going to transition to a, a video from one of our sponsors, Eureka. Thank you. Therapeutics, we understand that every patient is unique and requires personalized treatment. By harnessing the power of one's immune system, we strive to provide safer and more effective T cell therapies for a wide range of cancer types. We have joined forces with top cancer institutions, hospitals, and patient advocacy groups to bring our innovative investigational immunotherapies to patients. We are Eureka Therapeutics and we are committed to partnering with patients to win the fight against cancer. Thank you, Eureka, for supporting our symposium today. Um, our next speaker is going to be speaking about um, recent breakthroughs in, um, in liver disease. And this is Dr. Richard Kelman. He is a transplant hepatologist at Einstein Healthcare. He graduated from Tufts and did his, much of his training in Boston uh, and is now down in Philadelphia. Um, he runs the liver uh, tumor program there at Einstein, and he manages the multidisciplinary liver tumor conference and clinic. He's also interested not only in clinical care, but in research and does research in liver cancer, telemedicine, and palliative care. So thank you, Dr. Kalman, for joining us today. Thank you so much for the invitation. And um, I guess was told to include a couple of different um, topics in, in sort of my discussion today. So in addition to um, recent breakthroughs and, and hope on the horizon, I was asked to touch a little bit on uh, care for the liver transplant patients. And you know we do know that um, some patients who have liver cancer will go on to liver transplant, which in and of itself is, is a very overwhelming process, uh, but I'll do my best to sort of um, go over some of those topics um, over the course of the next 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so, you know, it's been a, a really important last couple of years uh, for the management of patients with liver cancer. Um, and, and specifically, I'm referring to patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, and so if we go back to um, 2007, just, you know, 14, you know, short years ago, you know, we really only had one medication for people with uh, advanced liver cancer. Uh, and that was an oral medication called serafinib. Um, you know, it was a medicine that, you know, did maybe extend survival for a couple of months, um, but although it was oral, was associated with uh, a lot of, of side effects. Um, and then it really wasn't for about 10 years 
um, that we didn't really have anything else in our toolbox. Um, then in, in 2017, um, we were granted two second line treatments that we were able to start using uh, another oral uh, agent called regorafenib and uh, the first immunotherapy, which I know has been discussed um, uh, for hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, the infusion uh, nivolumab. Um, and now, you know, where we stand in 2021, um, you know, I would argue we have a, a very clear uh, first line combination therapy that involves immunotherapy, um, which has been, you know, really very successful for some patients. Um, we find that the tumor just melts away and, and maybe even more importantly, in about 75% of patients, the tumor just stops growing on this combination therapy with a tezolizumab and bevacizumab. Um, so that for us is now in 2021, very much the standard of care. Um, in second line, I would argue there's probably, you know, maybe three kind of agents, two oral agents and, and another infusion. And then uh, as sort of third line, uh, we have an additional four agents. So if we go back to where we are just a couple of years ago, where we had only really one option, you know, there is a lot of hope on the horizon because we have so many more things that are uh, available for our patients. Um, but I, I wanna take even a, a step back and I think something that's important to recognize is that you know, when we talk about liver cancer, you know, unfortunately less than half of patients um, who are diagnosed with liver cancer will be caught at an early stage. Um, so I think it's worthwhile talking a little bit about what's involved in trying to detect liver cancer early and in fact, there is some new hope on the horizon here too. Um, so for patients who are at risk for developing liver cancer, uh, namely those who have chronic liver disease, you know, most often patients who have cirrhosis, um, we're suggesting that these patients get a uh, ultrasound every six months. And uh, for most people, it's recommended that they get a blood test with a tumor marker called an alpha fetoprotein or AFP. Um, and while that might not sound overwhelming, it's very hard for patients to have to go through an ultrasound every six months. And for many of these patients, that this is lifelong. Um, and in fact, the vast majority of patients will you know, get these ultrasounds and actually not really derive any benefit from them. And why do I say that? I say that because um, most patients, thankfully, with chronic liver disease will not get liver cancer in their lifetime. So probably more than two thirds of patients will not. Um, and then there will be some false positives that come up too. Patients will get a, a scary call from their doctor about a, a possible spot that was found on an ultrasound. Maybe they even go on to require uh, a liver biopsy to sort of figure out what's going on and go through the risks of that and all for potentially not finding anything that's you know, really of note. Um, so one of the things that I think we're really excited about are some different tests that will hopefully allow us to um, pick up on liver cancers early when they're most treatable. Um, and there are some blood tests that are coming out um, in the future that we hope will be you know, better sort of markers for patients who are at risk for liver cancer and maybe obviate the need for uh, ultrasounds every six months for, for a lifetime for, for many of these of, of our patients. Um, and then I, I think the uh, other challenge that we have is, is trying to engage patients in such a way that we're able to get their screening done on um, regular timeframes. And what that means for some people is having to take an additional day off of work to get their ultrasound, having to have somebody maybe take them to the hospital to get this done, and, that, and they're just remembering to do it. So there are some simple things that are being looked into to hopefully improve really um, compliance with getting these screening tests done. You know, and, and right now we're seeing that probably less than 25% of patients who, who need to be getting screened for liver cancer uh, are getting regular screening. So I do think there's hope on the horizon for doing a better job there too. Um, and then, you know, in, in terms of the treatment, I think that we're going to see several aspects in the future that uh, will improve. So, you know, if we think about uh, treatment for patients that have very localized disease, small tumors that, that we would hope would be curable, 
Um, you know, right now what we're doing is that patients are either being considered for uh, surgical resection if they're a candidate for that, or localized therapy, which I know has been discussed earlier today, um, either instilling some chemotherapy into that portion of the liver or some radiation. And that's generally kind of all that we do. But I think that now that immunotherapy is, is so much becoming the standard of care, it, it seems that we're going to probably come to a point where we can maybe combine the immunotherapy agents along with these other localized treatments to maybe improve outcomes for patients. Because depending on, on the size of the tumor and the treatment that's involved, you know, maybe upwards of 50 to 60% of patients will have a recurrent tumor um, in their lifetime. And so anything that we can do to um, decrease that risk would, would certainly be a good thing. And I know that there are, are several trials ongoing. We were involved with one at Einstein where we're gonna be looking at combining localized therapy with um, these immunotherapies. And then for patients, who have more advanced disease, I, I think something that I, our expectation will be is that we'll be doing more personalized approaches. And um, that sort of brings me up to another interesting topic here. And one of the things that actually made me most interested in uh, liver cancer when I was a trainee was that it's one of the few cancers that often can be diagnosed without a biopsy, just based on, on imaging findings. In fact, 90% of the time, you know, we can actually make a confident diagnosis with just CAT scan, MRI, or, or a very sort of specialized ultrasound. Um, and while that's been good for, for many people, um, we, we've kind of fallen a little bit backwards in terms of research because we don't get the same data about the particular tumor when we're not necessarily getting a, a biopsy. And, and I think what's going to be happening in the future with personalized medicine is that we may be going back to biopsying uh, a lot for these liver tumors and then looking at the different receptors on the tumors and, and finding sort of different things on them to help us to understand which medications or maybe which combined medications will be most beneficial for people when um, they have a diagnosis of liver cancer. Um, so I think we're gonna be moving into the forefront of personalized medicine, which I know is, is already the case in many other malignancies, but for liver cancer is, is still a little bit further, further behind. And then, um, you know, in the last couple of minutes, um, I think it's important to talk a little bit about liver transplant. Um, although liver transplant is, is a, a sort of a, a, obviously a very big deal for, for most people, you're talking about a, upwards of a four to six hour surgery, sometimes longer, you know, being in the hospital for a couple of weeks, and then having to be on medication for the rest of your life to protect uh, that, that new liver, we do know that it's associated with the best outcomes for liver cancer. Um, and in fact, we would usually quote um, a tumor-free survival rate of probably more than 90% if someone's able to go on to have liver transplant. So that means the tumor coming back is probably less than 10% for most people. Um, so the, the reason why the outcomes are so good is because in addition to the tumor coming out, um, for most people who have underlying cirrhosis, the cirrhosis comes back too, comes out too. And so the likelihood of the tumor coming back now that the cirrhosis is gone is, is dramatically reduced. While we're able to treat little tumor spots in, in other ways, perhaps with chemotherapy and radiation, it doesn't treat the whole liver. And we know that the whole liver, unfortunately, is prone to developing liver tumors um, over time uh, in the setting of cirrhosis. Um, and I, I would actually make the argument that if you look at liver transplant as, as purely a, a cancer treatment, um, if you look at the outcomes, it, it's probably the most successful cancer treatment for any intra-abdominal cancer that, that's out there. So if one thinks about liver transplant that way, um, it, it clearly becomes something that you know, we're hoping to be able to offer to our, our patients you know, when people are in, in my situation. Um, but not everybody is going to be a candidate for liver transplant. And in fact, there's very specific criteria in terms of the size of the tumor um, for who could potentially be a candidate for liver transplant. And then we have to take other things into consideration, like the patient's age and what their comorbidities are, and if they would be able to potentially tolerate uh, the big surgery that's required for a liver transplant. 
And then, you know, even just getting on the transplant list is, is a major Herculean effort. The listing process involves multiple tasks, meeting with lots of specialists, and that's even just to get on the list. Um, and then for, for many people, they'll be on the list for many months, sometimes several years before they'll even get an organ offer. You know, during that time, um, one's getting regular blood work, usually getting picture tests of the liver, either with a CAT scan or, or MRI, you know, every one to three months in order to make sure that if new tumor spots um, pop up, we're able to treat them before transplant so that there's not too much tuber in the liver before it comes out. And people are, are listed for liver transplant in this country based on something called the, the MELD score, the Model for End-Stage Liver Disease. Uh, this is a score that takes into account four different uh, blood tests in order to help prioritize who should go to the top of the list for transplant. Unlike other transplants in this country, like kidney transplant, for example, you know how long you're on the transplant list doesn't really factor into how soon you're going to get a liver transplant. It's all based on how sick somebody is and, and what this MELD score is, which ranges on a score from six to 40, six being very low, meaning the liver's in pretty good shape, uh, 40 meaning that the liver is very, very sick. And we do know that, that some of our patients with liver cancer, you know, their, their own lab score or MELD score will be relatively low. So we get people um, extra points on the liver transplant list while they're um, waiting for their liver so that we can hopefully get them um, to the point of getting a surgery. And then um, for patients who go on to, to have liver transplants, there are often frequent lab draws and frequent office visits. At my hospital, people after transplant have to come to the office twice a week uh, at the very beginning, and they're getting blood work once or twice a week as well. Then those visits uh, decrease in frequency uh, to the point where you may only be coming to the office once a month, then once every three months, and then eventually just once a year. Um, so our hope is that people go on to, you know, living a, a productive and, and happy life after transplant where they're not necessarily in the office the whole time. And then because the risk of liver cancer after transplant is not zero, um, we do um, also um, check on the, the new liver to make sure that there is uh, no tumors that come back. So for the first three years, we typically do an MRI or CAT scan every uh, six months. Um, and then we do one every year. And then once we get to the point of five years out from transplant, uh, we no longer look because the likelihood of the cancer coming back is basically zero. So uh, I know that I had to touch on a lot of topics. I know I'm, I'm now running out of time, but it, it was an absolute pleasure to be able to talk at this venue. Thank you so much to uh, Dr. Guy and, and Ivory Allison for inviting me. It, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Dr. Kalman, thank you. You had quite the task of going from everything from biomarkers to transplant in a quick uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So thank you for that. That was wonderful. Um, and we are going to talk about something that's equally uh, on people's minds, which is COVID uh, and vaccines. So I'm going to introduce now Dr. Bilal Hamid, who is a friend uh, and a, a really cherished colleague. Um, he's, the associate, he's an associate professor of medicine at the University of California in San Francisco, and he runs the hepatology clinic there as chief. Um, not only is he a wonderful clinician, but he is a researcher and has over 30 published articles in various journals and chapters and books. Um, and what's been really exciting for us in the liver community is to see Dr. Hamid really emerge as an expert in how to think about COVID and liver disease. And he's going to talk to us today about what we should be thinking about from a patient standpoint. So thank you, Bilal, for joining us. Uh, thank you, uh, Jennifer. Thank you, Irie, for the kind invitation. It's very exciting to uh, be part of the one of the speaker and panelists for this important session. As uh, Janice mentioned that I am currently working at UCSF, but uh, last year in March, when the COVID pandemic started, uh, some of us started thinking about how it will impact our patients with liver uh, diseases. And at that time, our American Society of uh, Liver Disease uh, created a working group to start uh, you know, discussing uh, about some of these important topics and how this will gonna 
uh, go forward. And I would encourage that there is a lot of good information also on our website, ASLD and other websites about some patient information about the COVID-19 and the vaccination. Uh, unfortunately, COVID-19 uh, is still present. Uh, and so far as 44 million people in the United States has been infected uh, with the disease and there are more than 700,000 deaths. And this is very sad to see still in our hospitals that patients are getting admitted. And the most important thing uh, with the fight for this pandemic was the emergence of these vaccinations, which has been a very important part of our uh, uh, you know, fight against the COVID-19. So my goal is that in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes to talk about uh, some of the effect of these vaccinations. But before we talk about the COVID-19 vaccination, it is important to know that the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, does uh, directly impact the liver. And there are certain things that we started realizing that patients who had COVID-19, they had elevated liver disease, they were young people or even older without any liver disease. And they were coming in uh, with a very high liver test. There are a lot of um, uh, other effect of direct virus effect as well as some inflammatory responses. However, uh, there are patients who had chronic liver disease, especially cirrhosis they had very high mortality or risk of dying if they were uh, getting COVID-19. There, there are a lot of studies now out there, and especially patients who had cirrhosis of the liver, uh, if they have underlying uh, liver cancer or alcohol-related liver disease, they were having a high mortality. And also, the more severe the liver disease or cirrhosis, they had even a higher mortality. There was one of the studies that they compared patients who had cirrhosis versus no cirrhosis and they had COVID-19 and they're up to 32% in the cirrhosis group versus 8% without cirrhosis, uh, unfortunately died from the COVID-19. So one uh, that therefore very early on, we realized that our patient with liver disease, especially cirrhosis and also post-transplant was very high risk and uh, therefore the priority to get them vaccinated as quickly as now, when we look at the uh, COVID, uh, in, before we even start about the COVID-19, one thing is important to understand that, you know, patients with chronic liver disease and uh, also when uh, there's people who have decreased immune, uh, uh, immune system or decrease in the immune system, they had a decreased response to other vaccines, whether it's hepatitis B or other. And also we had seen in the past that patients who had chronic liver disease, they had higher complications of infections uh, like flu or influenza or streptococcal infection. Uh, the important thing is that, that you know, vaccines uh, ideally, if can be given any vaccines before the transplant is the best uh, place there for all of our cirrhosis patients who are waiting for transplant. We want all of the vaccines to be given before transplant because after the transplant, the immunosuppression can even further decrease response. And same thing what we recommend for the COVID-19 uh, vaccination. So um, the first thing that started happening is about like when this uh, development of COVID-19 vaccine happened, uh, there are multiple different platforms. And one question we were recently asked is mRNA vaccine, which is both Pfizer and Moderna, that they develop very quickly. Uh, but we always talk about that this technology has been present for decades and there are a lot of work on oncology and other. The only thing that happened that during the COVID-19, they were got so much funding that they can uh, increase their research very quickly and therefore we were able. The one point is that there was no cutting the corner. The studies were done in a very diligent and very detailed manner. And therefore early on the vaccines had the emergency use authorization uh, in December and subsequently Pfizer in August got the full approval. So one point is very clear that these vaccines are very, very safe and all the, the clinical and all the scientific rigor was present in all the clinical trial. So there are now different kinds of vaccines that are available, uh, but I'll focus mostly what we have in the United States. So we have Moderna and Pfizer, which is an mRNA vaccine. And the concept of these uh, vaccines are that these uh, they have these like, you know, it's just, I was being explained very well that, you know, they need something to enter into the body. So it's like an m and &M candy that they have a heart shell. So this heart shell just entered and then there is no life virus in this. There is nothing that changed the DNA 
DNA, and then they trigger a response and immune system, and therefore they are required due dosages of these vaccines. Early on, when the clinical trial was going on, and then you know there were two dosages: the Pfizer is greater than 16 years, and, um, uh, and uh, Moderna is greater than 16 years, and Pfizer greater than 18. There are about 15,000 patients to 18,000 in different, and the vaccine efficacy was very good, meaning that uh, if you compare the patients who are uh, protection from hospitalization or death or severe disease, these were very efficacious in 95 to 100 percent of cases. Uh, although uh, the early on when these vaccine trials were going on, there were a few liver disease patients were involved. But since that time, we have significant data from real life uh, and a lot of studies that these these vaccines were very, very safe in patients with uh, liver disease, cirrhosis, and immunosuppressed as status. And therefore, uh, I am very comfortable uh, with the vaccination. And therefore, the guidelines have been very clear that any patients with liver disease, uh, we are recommending COVID-19 vaccine, uh, whether it's chronic liver disease, whether they have compensated or decompensated cirrhosis or liver cancer, and also uh, post-liver transplantation. And prior COVID-19 infection, uh, if someone has even a COVID-19 uh, infection, they should also be vaccinated because that's one of the questions have been asked very regularly uh, by us that I already exposed to COVID-19, I had an infection, should I get the vaccination? There is no uh, you know, obvious contraindication. The only contraindication that we are is the history of uh, immediate allergic reaction to the uh, polysorbate, which is a vaccine uh, compound to it. Otherwise, even if you have other food allergies or other AI, we talk to the immunologist, but otherwise we are recommending all patients with COVID, uh, uh, with liver disease to get the COVID-19 vaccination. And we are also not recommending or we should not stop any of the uh, medications. If you are taking hepatitis B medication, hepatitis C, primary biliary uh, uh, cholangitis, autoimmune hepatitis, if you are on liver cancer treatment or any immunosuppression, we are not recommending any change in the uh, medication dosages for, just for the vaccination. Uh, when you look at the side effects, initially early on, there was a lot of discussion about the anaphylaxis and, uh, uh, you know, the CDC have been monitoring there is a vaccine adverse event reporting system called VAERS, and the anaphylaxis rate is about 4.5 cases per million, and early on, they were mostly seen in women and 90% was within 15 minutes or so. Uh, this uh, anaphylaxis is very rare, as, as I mentioned, four. Million. And if you compare to another uh, other vaccines of anaphylaxis, like influenza has 1.4 per million cases or pneumococcal is 2.5 million uh, per cases. And zoster vaccine is 9.6 per million. So we do have uh, uh, seen some anaphylaxis, but overall it's very rare. Most of the common side effects that has been seen with these vaccination are uh, side arm pain, uh, headaches or fever and fatigue. And it has been seen more with the second doses, although more younger people. And now with the additional dose, which we have seen that this is a similar side effect that we've seen with the second dose. Uh, there are some rare, you know, uh, myocarditis and pericarditis, which is like inflammation of the heart has been talked a lot in the literature out there, a lot of talk about it. The incidence of having that after the vaccine is 10.6 per million, normally seen within three days. And it is, there is no uh, clear death has been reported with it, mostly seen in young people. And that is not a contraindication for vaccine as because the actual myocarditis or inflammation of heart is very, very high, 14 times much higher with the COVID, actual COVID-19 infection. Uh, there are some neurological, uh, uh, you know, condition has been associated called Chiampari syndrome, which is like some weakness that has been associated, although very rare. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, these are some of the rare side effects have been seen with other vaccines, but that should not be precluding our patients not to get a vaccine. Now, adenovirus is one of the other uh, vector, which is like Johnson & Johnson vaccine, is it? And there is also vaccine approved in UK and rest of the world, AstraZeneca vaccine, which there were a lot of talk about thrombosis and blood clot that has been associated with a very specific 
uh, syndrome that happen within 15 days of the vaccination. And that has been seen mostly in women, but that is again a very rare event. And that's why, uh, you know, early on there was a pause in April for the vaccine, but now the Johnson & Johnson is are already being given. So I would, uh, again, that's a rare side effect that has been seen. Now, one other important thing started happening that, you know, uh, what is the benefit? Because the whole goal of vaccination uh, in any vaccine, especially COVID-19, does it can prevent uh, COVID-19? Number two, whether it can, uh, you know, having a severe complication like hospitalization symptoms or uh, death. I think that is a very important message because we hear about that, you know, there are patients even with COVID-19 um, had, uh, had COVID uh, infection, but that is uh, okay, but because majority of these patients who when had it, they did not have a severe disease or death or hospitalization. There was a study done at the uh, VA, uh, you know, there was a uh, hospitalization, like, you know, in patient with liver disease and cirrhosis, they looked at the data of about 20,000 patients. And after 28 days, the one dose of uh, the vaccine, there was a uh, 600% protection for hospitalization and death. And after second dose, the, the, it uh, persists. So, and there are overall a 78% reduction in COVID-19 infection. So even in patients with cirrhosis, uh, which we thought that the response rate may be lower, it was uh, the vaccination has been very important in preventing death and hospitalization. There are other studies have been done showing that, you know, in a large data sets that, you know, although in the real life setting, that despite the Delta variant that became more because early on when the studies were done, we were not having uh, the Delta variant came in a little bit later. So overall effectiveness was up to like 90%. However, there were some group of patients we started seeing that their response rate was much lower. And that's where the immunocompromised individual uh, as compared to someone who has a robust immune system uh, had more, uh, we say what we call breakthrough infection. And therefore, there were other studies also came out in transplant literature. There was a lot of talk about uh, John Hopkins are doing an amazing like studies about this. And they found out that, you know, early on after single dose or second dose, there were a group of patients who are post-transplant and immunosuppression, they had a decreased response. And uh, therefore, uh, CDC uh, in August uh, had this initial recommendation of what we call additional dose. And these were the patients who had did not had a good, uh, you know, thoughtfully that they think about all the studies and then you already had two dose and then the third dose will be needed to increase the immune system. This is different than a booster. So based on that recommendation, a third dose of Pfizer as well as Moderna was recommended after the initial two dose of MS, uh, these vaccine series for patients who are moderate to severe immunocompromised and that include our solid organ transplant patient. And third dose should be the same uh, vaccine that you got in the initial and it should be administered at least 28 days after the initial uh, series has been done. And, um, and that is uh, to be, and still after getting this vaccination, we're still recommending our patients to still follow all the precaution. And one thing is very important that we are recommending not our, all of our patients, but if household contact should also be encouraging them to get the vaccine. So we need to have a good bubble for our patients so that even if they have a decreased response, they would have less chance of getting exposure. Now, one other important thing that happened, people do ask us that, you know, with this uh, additional dose, which was recommended early on, the CDC does have a criteria and which patient they considered moderate to severe immune compromise. So any patient who had a uh, transplant, a uh, patient had uh, primary immunodeficiency or advanced or untreated HIV, or they were on immunosuppressive medication. The CDC does not explicitly specify cirrhosis patient, uh, but we do know that the immune deficit and hyper-responsiveness. So most of our experts were recommended that patient with especially cirrhosis who have much higher decompensation or history of decompensation should also be considered in the same category as just like chronic kidney disease patient on dialysis. Now, since that time, the, uh, the booster has been also approved for the Pfizer vaccine, and these are uh, any patients who are either 65 or who have a high exposure, so most of our cirrhosis patients will be. And there is, the booster is, uh, the data started coming out that for Pfizer initially, and there is some data on Moderna that 
after six months, the response or the immune, uh, the immunity may be waning down. And that's why the patients uh, uh, may need or every one of us. So a lot of us has already got if they had received the Pfizer. Moderna is right now not approved for a booster, but the FDA will recommend likely today. There is some discussion that maybe a half a dose would be or a small dose would be recommended, but we have to wait uh, for these things to be uh, now, one question also being asked very commonly to us is that whether uh, if all of our patients or patients need to be having the immunoassays, meaning to assess to detect immunity, that is, it is important to know that there are certain FDA approved, but then these assays uh, does not detect everything that we want. And right now we are not recommending that, you know, uh, we should be getting assays and for neutralizing antibodies decision because immune system does a lot of different things and it uh, even there are uh, different kind of immune system and that can help with preventing COVID-19 infection. So uh, although there are some places who are checking it regularly, it's not FDA recommended in our institution, we are uh, not checking it uh, on a, a regular uh, basis. So I would, uh, and you know, even if everyone who have all of us who got vaccine and all the patients, it's very, very important right now to still following all the uh, recommendation of social, you know, if possible, if you are in a crowd state indoor, I would strongly recommend wearing a mask because we don't know and our patients were immunocompromised and the response rate may not be as good as it. So therefore it is very important for us to continue to follow. Now, there are a few questions that always comes out that if a patients who are um, on the transplant list and they got a one, uh, one dose of COVID-19 vaccine and it's only called for a transplant, so uh, we just recommend that you don't have to restart the series four weeks after the transplantation, as long as the overall health is good, that you can get a vaccine uh, after the four weeks of transplantation. But these are some of the uh, recommendations that we uh, have and uh, so I'm gonna uh, stop here and I would uh, you know uh, would be happy to answer any questions and uh, I'm sorry I didn't keep an eye on the time so I'm sorry if I went over thank you thank you Dr. Hamid that was fantastic that literally covered every question that we get as clinicians um, with our patients and I know that there are a lot of questions about about COVID vaccine. And, and one thing that did come up into the, the chat was um, in people, for example, who have gotten their booster, uh, their third shot um, in the pre-transplant setting. So that's why in, in the post-transplant setting, Dr. Hameen made the important point that it's that three shots are recommended. Um, and it's a little bit different than quote what we call a booster. Um, but here um, for the pre-transplant setting uh, shot and what are the, and anticipated side effects of a third um, shot as compared to the first two? And is there that's any right. concern for delaying lab tests, CT scan, MRI after yeah. that? Yeah, that's an excellent uh, question. You know, there was actually CDC that came up and looking at the first, I think, a million patients who had the booster or additional dose. Uh, one thing is that that they has actually the same, act, uh, sorry, it's not published in the, there is an uh, ID society meeting just happened two weeks back and they did present it, this data that the same side effects or similar side effects with the second dose. So there was no additional side effects that happened. One other data that was very interesting that there was, we did not see with uh, the COVID-19 vaccine any rejection risk or there are case reports of elevation of liver enzymes and uh, you know I have some patient my personal experience with autoimmune hepatitis I've seen them their liver just going up and so what I have you know I don't uh, check any labs uh, two weeks or three weeks after the COVID-19 vaccine because it that makes everyone uh, confused and I have uh, patient they are but you just have to pay attention as a clinician and it is uh, also, the most of the side effects of fevers, and it's it's a question clinical that are decompensated or patient who have ascites or other very sick patients who had a fever and fatigue and tiredness and other symptoms. And what how do you differentiate? So most of these side effects happen within 48 hours. So if something happened after 48 hours, I would worry about and take it more like if the fever is persisting. And so uh, normally I think in the first 48 hours, that is one of those things. Now we do not recommend like, you know, even if you're getting any cancer treatment as medication, I would not change it. We have not seen any other 
concerning thing. So that is uh, one of the, at least I have it. Uh, increase in blood sugar is hard to say, right? I have, I know we have not seen that, but there can be other things that, uh, so one of the question is it. And I would not delay any like, you know, scans or anything. And one of the important thing that I forgot to mention is that we, it is completely fine. Don't forget the other vaccination, especially flu vaccine. And you can get the flu vaccine and the booster or additional shot of COVID-19 at the same time. A lot of places are doing it and it is perfectly fine uh, not to delay any vaccine, number one. And number two, you can also please get your flu vaccine in addition to uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Mead. Um, a final point is a question came in through, is there reliable checks for immunity to COVID. And I think you really pointed out that right now we don't understand truly how to use the antibody tests in part because the titer to really re reflect immunity we don't understand. And that you know antibody titers are just checking what we call a B cell response, but there is something yeah. very important called a T cell response that can help protect us uh, from COVID as well. So thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Coleman. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. Um, we're gonna listen to a video from one of our sponsors, Merck, and then we'll be back to hear from Dr. McDonald. exciting to have Dr. McDonald here with us today to talk to us about nutrition and the liver. Dr. McDonald is a gastroenterologist at the University of Chicago Medical Center, uh, where he is an assistant professor of medicine. He is also a professionally trained chef, and he's going to share with us today thinking about nutrition from both perspectives. Um, he's worked for many years at something called Project Brotherhood, which is a healthcare clinic dedicated to providing accessible, affordable care for Black men on Chicago's South Side. He uses creative approaches to helping us improve community health and enjoys giving healthy cooking demonstrations in, to underserved communities. Thank you, Dr. McDonald, for being with us today. Thanks for inviting me. It's really an honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to present and join some of my colleagues here. Uh, and I've been always a big fan of uh, your work. OK. So I want to briefly talk about diet and fatty liver disease. So the name of the presentation is What's on Your Plate? A food, Diet, and Fatty Liver Disease. Uh, thank you so much for the excellent introduction. I'm always humbled hearing my own introduction. Uh, a couple disclosures. I'm on a couple of advisory boards uh, for AbbVie, Takeda, and Braggs. And my role on those boards is really uh, being a reminder that uh, the drugs don't work without diet. <laughs> So I show up to the pharmaceutical companies and tell them that uh, they essentially have to figure out ways to encourage uh, healthy eating and healthy lifestyle besides just encouraging medications. So uh, I am a doctor. I went to culinary school also. Uh, and so I'm a chef and I'm also nutrition focused. And when I give a talk and uh, talk about nutrition and my background, most people ask like, why in the world as a doctor, uh, are you also a chef? This makes no sense. Um, but I like to share a couple different reasons to provide better context, okay? So I really tell people three reasons. Um, first and foremost, uh, this is a picture from probably about 14 years ago. Um, it shows my grandparents, my grandmothers, um, specifically who I wanna talk about. So I was raised by wonderful matriarchs and they taught me the joy of cooking at an early age. And uh, there were times in my life when I was younger and my mother had to be hospitalized 
I had to cook for myself because my dad, unfortunately, was part of the generation of men that thought cooking was uh, an offense to their gender. Um, so I uh, needed to eat and I had to figure out how to do it on, on my own. But thankfully, my grandmothers pulled me aside and gave me my, my first cookbooks and taught me everything I know needed to know to be a great cook. And subsequently, I got my first job at a uh, restaurant at McDonald's when I was 16. Uh, but I was so into cooking, I actually ended up becoming a, ma a manager at McDonald's at 16. And when I became a manager, I started cooking stuff that wasn't even on McDonald's menu, uh, which you should never do that. But I was 16 and, you know, still slightly immature. And I thought it'd be cool to just, you know, cook omelets and frittatas and, you know, all this crazy stuff. So my McDonald's actually had a secret menu. And uh, people would actually come in specifically to my McDonald's for the secret menu. Uh, subsequently, I did get fired at some point. <laughs> uh, another reason why I got a nutrition is because of uh, actually church. So I'm from Chicago, grew up here on the south side and going to church on the south side of Chicago. Um, I remember being younger and hearing about people being uh, sick and shut in, as they say, for various conditions, uh, including liver disease, uh, but also diabetes, also heart attacks and strokes. And I remember asking my parents and other people like, you know, why are, you know, folks coming down with these conditions where they're hospitalized and now we're praying for people and everyone would say, well, it's the foods that they're eating. And for me, I'm like, well, how come we don't pray that people eat different food? <laughs> how come we don't figure out how to address some of those issues? And it's, it's been one of the, the questions that I still ponder to this day. And it's also one of the passions and one of the reasons why I actually do what I do. Um, and just to give you an example, um, from a public health perspective, specifically talking about Chicago, uh, Inglewood is a neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, and I've gone to churches in the Inglewood area. Uh, Lakeview is a neighborhood on the north side, predominantly Caucasian. Uh, Inglewood is predominantly Black. If you look at the rates of diabetes in these neighborhoods, specifically the rates of death, very different, okay? So in Inglewood, about 101 people uh, per 100,000 people die from diabetes, whereas in Lakeview, it's uh, 35 per 100,000. Now, I would still say that 35 is too much, okay? That 35 is too much, but the 101 is also definitely too much, but there's a clear, distinct disparity, and I witnessed that growing up. Uh, so that kind of put me in a position to be uh, inspired me to do what I'm doing right now. So what does this have anything to do? What does this have to do with fatty liver disease? Well, um, fatty, fatty liver disease specifically uh, in terms of its risk factors and its prevention involves cooking, food, and the connection of those to disease. And similar to everything I mentioned, cooking, food, and disease, uh, and, and all the interconnections have definitely been something I've been interested in studying and figuring out how to address. Uh, and it's also one of the reasons why I do, I do a lot of cooking classes and cooking demonstrations here in Chicago. So this is a, a class that I do at least once a month at one of the uh, junior high schools uh, here in the city. So I'm cooking uh, this class at uh, Inglewood Montessori here on the south side. This is me showing some uh, a young man how to, uh, I think we're cutting up uh, some dates to make a healthy dessert. So my goals for the rest of the presentation is to primarily focus on fatty liver disease. I want to talk briefly about its prevalence, uh, some dietary risk factors for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and data dietary strategies to treat non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And also I want to get into a couple different recipe ideas and then ideally leave a little bit of time left over for questions. Okay. So is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease a problem? I would say it's definitely a problem. It's definitely a problem for a lot of different reasons. I mean, uh, one, the term non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, we have not been using this term for a long period of time, okay? Uh, at least a, a long period of time, not by my standards. So the first time the term was really used um, in the medical literature was around 2002. Uh, when the New England Journal of Medicine published a, a review, uh, essentially kind of uh, sharing some of the diagnostic criteria for, for fatty liver disease, specifically non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. 
Uh, I remember as a medical student, so I started medical school in 2003, we had zero lectures on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease at that time. Uh, so it just wasn't part of the curriculum uh, for the most part. Uh, we did focus on alcoholic liver disease and how alcohol can also uh, be associated with some fat accumulation in the liver, but specifically non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and its connection to uh, metabolic syndrome and other metabolic conditions was not really a part of our core curriculum. Um, and when I went to residency, I did my residency at Northwestern, uh, we routinely would check ultrasounds for uh, people who had abdominal pain looking for gallstones. And we also routinely would check, check uh, liver tests. And if we identified fatty liver disease at that time, it was kind of something that wasn't taken seriously. Uh, you see some uh, ultrasound that demonstrated a little bit of fat on it. You know, my attending at the time, the radiologist, my other co-residents, they would just say, oh, it's fatty liver. It's nothing. Uh, don't worry about it. Or if we check some uh, liver tests and they were just mildly elevated, uh, we do work up for a lot of different rare diseases, but then we would just attribute everything to fatty liver disease and the conversation would stop. There would be no conversation about food, diet, even exercise or things that we can do to prevent the fatty liver disease from progressing, uh, but also to you know prevent it from even forming in the first place. It was just not part of the conversation. And arguably it should have been because right now, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is the second leading indication for liver transplant in the United States, and that's only beyond, beyond, behind alcohol, uh, alcoholic liver disease, and that may be changing. So at some point in the future, maybe even the near future, uh, this is going to be the number one reason for liver transplant. Um, now, in general, we're transplanting so many people for fatty liver disease because it affects a lot of people. Uh, so it's estimated about 80 million individuals have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in the United States. So that's about 30% of the population. That is a lot of people. I mean, I live in Chicago. We have a little bit less than uh, 3 million people just for frame of reference. Uh, 80 million is a lot more than the 3 million that stays in this city uh, that I consider a big city. So why is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease so common? I mean, I think that is a good question, but the answer is fairly obvious. Um, our standard American diet, uh, also known as SAD, it really promotes disease. Uh, it really does. Not only non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, and there's connections with dementia, uh, chronic kidney disease, high blood pressure, uh, so our diet puts us at risk for a lot of conditions that can have a uh, serious impact, not only on our lifespan, but also how well we enjoy our lives because no one wants to, you know, really be sick. Um, and just to give you a further frame of reference, um, this is a slide uh, taken from one of my lectures that I give to our medical students when uh, I talk about nutrition. Thankfully, uh, the medical school curriculums nowadays have room to talk about nutrition, whereas when I was a medical student, which was not that long ago, in my humble opinion, it really wasn't part of the curriculum. We just focused on vitamins and that was about it. And we focused on like the biochemistry of stuff, not necessarily actual food and epidemiology associated with food related illnesses. Um, so nonetheless, uh, this is from a study that was in JAMA uh, that estimated the contribution of multiple different risk factors to the leading causes of death in the United States. And what they found was uh, dietary risk uh, were associated with 529,000 deaths per year. 83% uh, of those were due to cardiovascular disease. But what this slide also illustrates that of all the 17 leading risk factors associated with early mortality or mortality in the United States, diet was the number one. So diet uh, had more of an impact on our mortality than smoking cigarettes, than having high blood pressure, than carrying a little bit of extra weight and having an elevated BMI, having high blood sugars, et cetera. Uh, it, it, it was uh, more significant than air pollution and a lot of things that we are uh, really concerned about. So it's not surprising. Okay. So one of the reasons why diet is uh, a risk is because not only the foods that we're eating, but we're also eating more foods in general. So there was a good study by the USDA that demonstrated that over the past um, 30, 40 years or so, uh, we increased our cal caloric intake by 523 calories. Okay. Uh, every day. So 523 calories, that's essentially an extra meal. 
Uh, and 60% of our calories in total come from ultra processed foods. Okay, so this is basically junk food, 6% of our calories for the average person. And this is not the average African American, it's not the average white person, it is the average person in America. 60% uh, of our calories come from ultra processed food. So this is very, uh, this is an American issue. Um, and I like to point out that other countries are eating a little bit less ultra processed foods than us. Now that may change, uh, you know, uh, our, our diet, our Western culture, that's one of our, our biggest exports. So, you know, more people across the globe are starting to eat like us. And that's also a problem. This is why fatty liver disease is increasing, not only here in the United States, but also worldwide. So in France, only about 36% of the calories for the average French person comes from uh, ultra processed foods, which is different than what we're doing in the United States. Um, now, why are we doing ultra processed foods in the United States? Well, there was a good market research survey that showed um, when they asked people that question, why are you eating ultra processed foods? So 43% of the people said they were affordable, 41% said they were easy, 20% they said they tasted good, and another 61% said they were convenient. Now, this is all true. Like, I get it. Uh, I've, you know, grown up eating ultra processed foods and spent most of my adulthood trying to eat less of them uh, for all of these reasons. So just for the sake of conversation, uh, there are four different types of food processing, okay? And we call uh, these types the NOVA classification. So you have your unprocessed and minimally processed foods, your processed culinary ingredients, which is like the sugar, oils, and fats, your processed foods, which are like canned foods and stuff like that. The processed foods seem very similar to their... Um, they're minimally processed or unprocessed uh, relatives, but your ultra processed foods, they're a whole different thing. So ultra processed foods, basically you need industrialized ingredients. And I think one of the biggest, uh, the simplest way to identify ultra processed foods, if you look at the back of the food label and you look at the ingredients, and if it reads like a chemistry set, it is probably ultra processed food. Um, so if you feel like you have to have a PhD and you know, chemistry or chemical engineering to understand what you're eating, it is probably ultra processed. So why am I speaking so much on ultra processed foods? Because, you know, these are some of the foods that are probably one of the main contributors to not only us gaining weight, but also fatty liver disease. And in terms of weight gain, there was a good study that demonstrated my concern. Uh, so this study was a smaller study, only had about 20 people, but it's revolutionary. And what they did was they asked the question, can ultra processed foods increase caloric intake? In the sense that, can they make us eat more? Uh, so they put people on a diet of two weeks of ultra processed foods and two weeks of unprocessed foods and switched them. And they uh, wanted to see what the impact of ultra processed foods and unprocessed foods were on uh, not only their weight, but also how much food they consume. Uh, so they match the meals and make them the same. Okay. So the ultra processed foods versus unprocessed diets, meals, they had the same calories, the same macronutrients, the same sugar, sodium. They tried to literally make things as, as, as close as possible. Uh, here's a good example of one of the ultra processed, uh, diets or meals. It's sneaky. Okay. It doesn't look too bad. It doesn't look too bad when you, when you look at it. Uh, but when you get to the fine details, it's actually very, very processed. And here is one of the unprocessed meals uh, from the study. So during the two weeks of the ultra processed foods uh, phase of the study, they found that the average person, uh, they let people snack on whatever they wanted to snack on, as long as it was either ultra processed or unprocessed, depending on which part of the study you ran. Okay. So the ultra processed people actually snacked more. Uh, they ate in, they took in about 500 calories more than when they were doing unprocessed. And they also looked at hormone levels uh, that are responsible for hunger. So while on the ultra processed food phase of the study, the hormone levels associated with hunger actually increased and people were hungrier. Uh, so they ended up eating more. And this is one of the reasons why almost 40% of the people in the United States uh, have a little bit of extra weight and it can be defined as having obesity. Uh, so basically, our diet is a setup. Okay, so what can we do? What can we do with food and diet to prevent non alcoholic fatty liver disease or to even reverse it, or to decrease its progression? Okay, or to minimize the risk of developing uh, liver cancer. Um, so there's a lot of different things we can do. So let's start with drinks. Okay, so coffee consumption was associated with a 33% decreased risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and a meta-analysis of about 11 different studies, okay? So what do I mean by coffee? I don't mean the latte that tastes delicious, that has, 
you know, the little design that the barista put in, puts in there. Yeah, it's delicious. I get it. But we are simply talking about uh, filtered black coffee. And I want to emphasize the word filtered. OK, so French press and some of the, you know, fancy uh, special makers that you have at home on the stovetop where there's no filter. Uh, that is not exactly what I'm referring to, even though that can be black coffee also. But the, uh, the unfiltered coffee uh, can potentially increase uh, your cholesterol to some degree because some of the lipids that are associated with uh, some of the fats that are associated with coffee are not filtered out. OK, so we're specifically talking about filtered coffee. OK, um, another uh, strategy that involves drinks is actually drinking less alcohol. Um, so, yes, alcohol is associated with uh, alcoholic fatty liver disease, but in someone who has uh, underlying fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, even consuming some alcohol may in and of itself be a reason that that liver disease can progress. Um, what about dietary patterns? Okay, so uh, very simple, uh, plant-based diet, eating more fruits and vegetables uh, may uh, have some positive benefits on uh, decreasing the risk of fatty liver disease, or even uh, preventing progression to worsening stages of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, Mediterranean diet, a lot of studies have looked at the Mediterranean diet. So what is the Mediterranean diet? And at the end of the presentation, I'm going to give an example of what a kind of a dietary strategy for Mediterranean would look like uh, with for a week. But Mediterranean diet in general is not necessarily plant based. Uh, it, the Mediterranean diet does not really involve consuming a lot of red meat, uh, but it does involve consuming more fish and seafood, if anything. Uh, maybe a little bit of chicken, but the diet is, is mostly kind of beans, green leafy vegetables, nuts, and uh, there's also heavy use of olive oil, okay? So what about specific foods, okay? So let's talk about specific foods, not just dietary patterns, but individual foods in general uh, that may uh, play a role in decreasing our risk of uh, developing fatty liver disease. But again, the specific foods, I want to remind you, this has to be part of a pattern, okay? So it's not just, you know, one food, you, you know, you eat it once and your risk goes away. It's about the pattern. Uh, so the power is definitely in the pattern, okay? Spinach. Uh, there was a good study that demonstrated spinach consumption uh, for people who ate spinach compared to non-consumers. Uh, there was an association with a decreased risk of devel developing fatty liver disease uh, and also even progression of fatty liver disease. Now, I do want to point out uh, one thing, um, which uh, I wish my mom would have learned in the 80s, boiled spinach. Uh, based upon the study, did not help, okay? So boiled spinach was not associated with uh, a, a decrease in the risk of fatty liver disease. Um, so boiled spinach, especially if you don't put any seasoning on it, I feel like, honestly, it's a crime against humanity. Um, I, I, I endured, you know, spinach for probably, boiled spinach probably for the first couple of decades of my life. And, you know, once I uh, moved out and was able to cook on my own completely, I found a new love of raw spinach. So garlic, garlic was a, another individual ingredient that's been associated with uh, a decreased risk of progression of fatty liver disease. So there have been uh, multiple studies that have looked at garlic supplements um, that may play a role, but ideally, you know, even just using uh, garlic a little bit more on your food, I'm not necessarily advocating that people go home and start, you know, eating garlic cloves and stuff like that, but incorporating garlic in some of your dishes uh, throughout the week may have some additional health benefits. Uh, plus it adds a lot of flavor. Okay. So in culinary school, we always use garlic. It's one of those, uh, aromatics that just makes things taste good, but you can't overdo it. Uh, so olive oil and other, monounsaturated fatty acids. Okay. So I put mufas in, uh, and uh, parentheses, I, I remember I was giving a talk at a, at a church once and I said mufa and uh, everybody thought I said a curse word. It was very awkward. And I was just talking about mono, monounsaturated fatty acids. Uh, but olive oil is one example. It's not the only example. Okay. So uh, uh, avocado oil is a uh, monounsaturated mono fatty acid. Um, and also canola oil, but uh, there's probably more evidence for fatty liver disease specifically uh, focusing on olive oil, okay? Uh, now, what about dark chocolate? I want to emphasize dark chocolate. So I'm not saying chocolate in general, okay? 
Uh, but there have been some studies that have demonstrated that uh, chocolate specifically may have some anti-inflammatory pro properties that can decrease the risk of steatohepatitis or NASH in people who have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So I'm not talking about the you know chocolate that you're seeing at the checkout aisle at the grocery store. Those are probably not dark chocolate. So real dark chocolate should have a percentage uh, on the, the package. So even if it just says dark chocolate, it may not necessarily be real dark chocolate. You should see uh, a percentage, such as like 70% dark or 88% dark, etc. And uh, the definition for dark chocolate, it has to have at least 70% cocoa uh, to be considered dark chocolate. Okay. So if the percentage is like 55% is not dark chocolate. And if it doesn't say the percentage, it's not dark chocolate. Okay. Uh, if it's like 88%, great. Uh, the only caveat is the higher um, the percentage of uh, chocolate, the more bitter it becomes. Okay. Uh, so for people who, you know, love dark chocolate, go for as high as you can go. Uh, for people who are not the biggest fan of dark chocolate, you may want to stick around that 70% range. Uh, but also be careful because chocolate can have a lot of calories so i'm not saying just eat chocolate all the time and uh, do it guilt-free you have to still pay in mind pay attention to the calories that you're consuming because uh, in general weight loss also is an effective strategy for fatty liver disease uh, so if you look at some of the guidelines uh, both european and american uh, they recommend losing at least seven percent of your body mass um, or seven percent of your body weight to minimize or decrease the risk of fatty liver disease or disease progression uh, nuts can be associated with uh, decreased risk of developing fatty liver, fatty liver disease. Uh, so what nuts? I mean, almonds, uh, sunflower seeds, so just nuts in general. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids, uh, which you can also get from nuts, uh, but you also can get them from fatty fishes like fatty fish such as salmon, okay? So PUFAs, that, those are polyunsaturated fatty acids, okay? So, you know, other sources of omega-3 fatty acids that you can get from food, not just, uh, not just fish, not just nuts, but uh, chia seeds, flax seeds, um, hemp seeds. Hemp seeds are becoming more popular nowadays, but be careful if you're getting drug tested. There's some studies that have demonstrated that if you're consuming a lot of hemp seeds, that actually may uh, contribute to a risk of having a positive drug test for marijuana. Uh, hemp seeds are tasty. I mean, they're great nutritionally, but uh, if you're getting drug tested, be careful. So cooking strategies, how, how do we incorporate all this into, you know, something useful? So I just showed you a whole bunch of food, you, you know, what do we really do, do with it? Um, so the Mediterranean diet, I, I like this slide, it came from a combination of uh, a research study that was looking at a combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. Uh, so dietary approaches to stop hypertension, uh, which is also known as the DASH diet. Uh, they basically combined the two and uh, just gave simple, just a simple approach, okay? So it's green leafy vegetables, you know, at least six times per week, doing other veggies at least once daily, uh, using nuts at least five times per week, uh, berries at least twice per week, uh, green, uh, eating beans at least three times per week, uh, whole grains three days per week, uh, fish at least once a week, uh, red wine. I put this, I highlight this because I'm not sure. Fatty liver disease, I think we need to do a little bit more research on the role of red wine. Uh, but for the sake of uh, conversation in this study, they did encourage uh, a glass of red wine a day. But I think that verdict is still out in the setting of fatty liver disease, especially for people who may also have uh, a component of alcohol use. Um, now, olive oil, uh, poultry two times per week, and overall, the dietary strategy uh, limits red meat, butter, cheese, pastries, fried foods, and all the ultra processed foods that I spend so much time talking about. Um, now, what does this really look like? Like now, now let's get down into how do you, what you, should you be cooking to incorporate some of these ingredients? Uh, salads, okay, simple. Get some spinach. Uh, you can throw some flax seeds, some nuts on there. You can throw other vegetables on there, and you can make your own salad dressing with olive oil. Very simple. Uh, just you know, equal parts vinegar, equal parts oil. Put it on there. If you don't like that tang. Add a little bit less vinegar. Uh, oatmeal, great way to add some omega-3 fatty acids in the morning. You start with the oatmeal, throw some chia seeds, some nuts on there, add some berries. You're going to get some servings of fruits and vegetables. Uh, simple as that. Uh, even put some hemp seeds on there. Grain bowls, again, grain bowls are very similar to salad. Um, 
You can also put some green leafy vegetables in there, but the foundation is going to be some sort of whole grain, uh, like brown rice or uh, quinoa would be another good option. Soups, again, soups are a great vehicle to incorporate vegetables. Uh, so if you look at lentil soup, uh, you can uh, saute some garlic, saute a little bit of onions, then throw some veggie stock in there, throw your beans, cook them down, and you can also throw some kale in there, and you're going to add some of the green leafy vegetables and some of the beans that may be associated with decreasing your risk of fatty liver disease. And if you wanted to, you can even throw some uh, little nuts on there as a topping. Stir fries, again, super duper simple. Uh, you can use a little bit of olive oil um, and basically saute some green leafy vegetables, some spinach, and simple, simple dishes to make that really don't take a lot of time that also can uh, fit within this Mediterranean style um, lifestyle. So I want to stop there and open the floor up for questions. Well, thanks very much, Edwin. Uh, and uh, whoa, you really kind of caught all our attention. We're just waiting for the menus. <laughs> <laughs> but again, that's really extremely wow this is very important information and very helpful for you. thank you i tell you like i was wet and lived every word i'm saying good bad and i'm sure we're all going through that check in for each other on like what we eat but uh, i especially for our uh, patients and loved ones we thank you again for uh, uh, joining with us today uh, this is really has been uh, beyond uh, uh, informative and helpful. I have to admit, we are learning as well with you. As we said in the beginning, Dr. Guy and Dr. Today in the morning said to you that uh, this is teamwork. And I think today we went through a lot of perspectives. Uh, we started with what's the liver, what's the function, we saw about the therapy, we saw about the risk factors, and we ended up how can we make our liver healthy. And I have to say, I'm rather very touched by all the questions and the discussion that went on, how can I keep my liver healthy? And this is really probably the best kind of first action we do, which is prevention is the best treatment. And please, please, very important to follow what we heard from Dr. McDonald, what we also heard from all other colleagues. And please, very important, especially for our loved ones and patients, if you have hepatitis B or hepatitis C, make sure you follow with your doctor. It's very important not to drop off from the screening needed. And as we heard also, treatment for hepatitis B, and of course, treatment or curative treatment for hepatitis C are key. Vaccination for hep B, proudly, we do it very well in the US. Sadly, some other parts of the world need to do it as good. And lastly, if we do all of those measures and still we end up with a cancer, it's not the end of the world. We can take care of you. Yes, we can do some curative intent in the beginning, but even if we can do that, we still have amazing therapies as we've heard at plenty details in that regard. Again, can't thank enough, especially the American Liver Foundation for giving that opportunity for us to really, in the Celebrating Liver Cancer Awareness Month, to really bring in all of us together. Of course, uh, as you can see on the screen, we have a lot of contacts that are very important for you. And uh, please, by all means, liverfoundation.org is your best, at least first go-to, but of course, 800 go liver. And of course, you can see other links that are all connected in one way or the other. So. Uh, please uh, reach out at any time and we're already available. We kind of, we really call ourselves cool doctors and we are really are very accessible and always happy to help in any way we can. When I think back on the last 25 years for the company, the learnings are deep and somewhat profound. We've done it our way. This is a hard business, but it's a really great business to be in when you've got the right team and the right mindset to go off and really attack some of the hardest problems in biomedical research. I think for most of us, when we start a company in the biomedical space, the objective is fairly narrow. We just want to solve a scientific problem. Hopefully, the solution to that problem may lead to a drug. From everything from access to government affairs to all touch points in the organization, the patient is at the focus. Patients aren't only front and center in what we do. 
But Exelixis also works with a variety of patient advocacy organizations who work with us to create a united front in good public health policy. As every aspect of the organization evolves, how do we have the vision to create the next wave of clinical studies that will help address those patients' needs, even as better therapies come onto the market? I would now like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Taddy. Dr. Tamar Taddy is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Section of Digestive Diseases at Yale University and Staff Hepatologist at the Virginia Kinetic, at the VA Connecticut Healthcare System in West Haven, Connecticut. She directs the Liver Cancer Program at VA Connecticut and runs a regional tumor board serving Southern New England's VA Medical Centers. She is Associate Director of the MD and PhD program at Yale School of Medicine. She is a board certified gastroenterologist with a certificate of added qualification in transplant, transplant hepatology. She is also the direct the chair of our National Medical Advisory Committee and one of our committee chairs for this event. I will now turn it over to Dr. Taddy. Thank you, Ivory, for that kind introduction. Um, I uh, am really excited to join you for day two of the conference. And um, today we're going to be discussing disparities in um, liver cancer outcomes and uh, access. We're gonna be discussing liver transplantation and we're gonna be hearing the voices of our patients and their caregivers. Uh, I have the duty of following in Dr. Guy's footsteps. She's a wonderful moderator. So uh, hopefully today will be um, as good as yesterday. Uh, it gives me tremendous pleasure today to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Robert Wong. Dr. Wong is Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Stanford University. And he's a staff physician of Gastroenterology and Hepatology section at the Veterans Affairs Palo Alto Healthcare System. And Dr. Wong is um, a uh, clinician, but also a clinical investigator with expertise in epidemiology. Um, and his clinical interests include management of patients with a variety of complex liver disorders, including viral hepatitis, hepatocellular carcinoma, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, but his research, which he's going to discuss today, focuses on the epidemiology and outcomes of patients with chronic liver disease and healthcare disparities among underserved minority populations. And so it's my great pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Wong. Thank you for being here today. Great, thank you so much for the nice introduction and it's an absolute pleasure and honor to be part of this program. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Perfect, that looks good. Um, so yeah, I think following on uh, yesterday's conference into today, um, my, my talk today will focus on healthcare disparities and liver disease. And while the focus is of this conference is on HCC, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different approach and try and focus on healthcare disparities that are present and affect patients earlier in the cascade, especially in patients with predisposing factors to HCC and also focusing on the early step of HCC screening. Here are my disclosures. So objectives of uh, my talk this morning uh, are to understand the complex cascade of care for patients with chronic liver diseases that ultimately can lead to HCC. I'm gonna try to illustrate some healthcare disparities that are experienced primarily or particularly by ethnic minorities and underserved vulnerable populations. And in doing so, I'm gonna try and focus on three specific areas in the next 20 minutes or so. And that's on disparities in hepatitis B, Hep C, and also HCC screening in cirrhotic populations. So as all of you here know, chronic liver diseases uh, patients are uniquely vulnerable populations. And across the country, we see that the majority of these patients affected comprise of ethnic minorities and underserved low socioeconomic status groups. We know that there's a high prevalence of risk factors such as alcohol, drug use, that not only predispose to liver disease progression itself, 
but also contribute to disparities in timely access to healthcare. These are data that you know, and most recent WHO estimates suggest that global hep B prevalence is probably closer to 296, almost 300 million worldwide. But this figure here really illustrates the diversity of the hep B population, with the majority of the global hep B population in Asia Pacific and African regions. A study we recently published um, looked at the ethnic makeup of US hep B patients. And as can be illustrated in this, um, this map, we see that the vast majority, as expected, of hepatitis B patients in the US come from uh, uh, international countries, primarily Asia Pacific regions, as you can see here, and African regions. And that's so important because it really stresses to us a few important facts. Number one, to understand and realize the importance of screening hepatitis B in these populations, but also be cognizant of potential healthcare disparities that these patients already exist due to disparities in access to care and um, their safety net population experience. In the US, not just ethnic minorities, but this is a study published about a year ago that also emphasizes the, the high risk populations we see in hepatitis B. And in fact, we see here that there's a relatively high prevalence of hep B in homeless individuals, prisoners, people who inject, uh, inject drugs, uh, co-infection with HIV, um, and also you know, some veteran populations, although a little bit less prevalent than other risk groups. It really emphasizes the diverse nature of hep B patients and the importance of understanding the underlying uh, disparities that these patients may experience. The HEP-B cascade, I'm going to be using this framework a couple of times in this talk. It really tries to illustrate the complex cascade that our liver disease patients experience. And this is a cascade that uh, I, I create, um, put together to illustrate hepatitis B. It's not as simple as it seems. And you can see here from the early um, stage of even screening, subsequently leads to diagnosis, linkage to care, not just linkage, but continued retention for monitoring, assessment for treatment, actually getting access to hep B treatment, successful treatment, and then ultimately the goal of reduced risk of disease progression to cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. And as you can see here in these oval uh, uh, boxes that I created throughout the cascade, there are so many potential opportunities for patients to fall out of the cascade, whether it's due to suboptimal screening, suboptimal linkage, di disparities in access to care, or even long-term follow-up to get routine HCC screening and surveillance. This is a paper published in Lancet a couple years ago using the, the, the Glo uh, Polaris Group um, uh, Consortium and highlights some of the global disparities in the HEP-B cascade. From the total population of HEP-B, you can see here that only a fraction are estimated to be diagnosed. And of those that are treatment eligible, again, only a small fraction of those are actually estimated to be on antiviral therapy. We um, a few studies uh, in the U.S. to illustrate these points and really emphasize low rates of hepatitis B testing and treatment among ethnic minority populations. This is a study published uh, a few years ago that used the REACH U.S. cohort that incorporated 28 communities across 17 states to look at differences in risk factors in delivery of care. They focused specifically on access, uh, sorry, assessment of hepatitis B testing you can see here in their total population, about 54,000, it was a pretty diverse population. You can see here, 40% African-American, about 31% Hispanic. And you can see here, Asian Pacific Islander, American Indian, Alaskan Native. These patients um, uh, 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 um, experience suboptimal hep B screening and testing. Overall, less than 40% were reported to be tested for hepatitis B, and even more concerning, of those with confirmed chronic hep B, only a third received continuing specialty care, which has been a predictor of access to treatment and long-term follow-up. 
Another study uh, um, looked at, oops, another study looked at differences in access to specialty care. So you can see here, among, oops, among patients diagnosed with chronic hep B, what were the rates of linkage to specialty care? Very dismal. 24% in African Americans, 34% Hispanics, 41% in API, 19% uh, in American Indian, Alaska Natives. Other disparities that this study identified compared to patients with health insurance, those with no health insurance had significantly lower rates of testing and lower rates of uh, confirmed diagnosis. The study also followed up and looked at other differences and found in addition to race, ethnicity, and insurance, they also saw disparities by education, household income, and primary language. And this really emphasizes that while we focus a lot on race ethnicity disparities, it's such a complex issue. And race ethnicity alone is not the, the only reason that contributes to disparities. And in fact, is probably a surrogate for a much more complex set of social issues that we really need to be cognizant of when trying to address healthcare disparities. Low treatment rates. Um, sorry, I'm trying to move this box. Oh, there we go. Low treatment rates, uh, uh, low, low rates of timely diagnosis and treatment among insured population. This was a a very nice study published last year in, in one of the JAMA um, journals that looked at the U.S. Truven market scan data. And they looked at an algorithm and identified hep B patients and identified only 30% of those with chronic hep B received therapy. And again, they identified important disparities in access to treatment. Um, another one, this is a study we did uh, in a safety net population, emphasized the same disparities among hep B patients, which were very diverse in this safety net cohort. We looked at linkage to care and retention to care. And we observed that only 63% had successful linkage to care. And of those links, less than 70% had retention. We saw significant disparities, primarily African-Americans and african Hep B patients had significantly lower rates of linkage to care. This translated uh, is important because it translates into more severe disease at presentation. In our cohort, we found that almost 30% of patients had cirrhosis at presentation, and many of them already had decompensation. Really emphasizing the importance of early diagnosis, linkage to care, and eventual treatment for these patients. Looking at treatment specifically in this um, study it was a, a multi-centered for safety net hospitals of over 5,000 patients. Among those that were eligible, just drawing your eyes to the bottom pie graph here, less than 50% actually received antiviral therapy. Furthermore, we found uh, significant disparities by insurance status and also ethnicity. And while this was an observational study and difficult to determine the exact etiology, we know that from previous studies, these disparities likely reflect many different socioeconomic factors. Why is that important for timely diagnosis? Because it helps um, improve linkage to care, treatments, and reduces long-term risks such as HCC. Therefore, disparities in hep B care that affect ethnic minorities and vulnerable populations further exacerbate existing structural barriers in timely access to care that these patients already face. Why is this important, tying it back to HCC? Many studies, including this one, show that antiviral therapy, by reducing viral load, suppressing replication, does reduce the risk of HCC in hep B patients. Uh, this was another study, a multi-centered real-world study that showed uh, the antiviral therapy, as you can see here in the dark line, compared to patients that were not treated, was associated with significantly lower risk of HCC on eight-year follow-up. When they stratified by cirrhosis or non-cirrhotics, again, you see the, the significance in reducing HCC, emphasizing the importance of timely linkage to care and treatment. Um, and, and so this is really emphasizing the importance in a hep B cohort 
of uh, addressing disparities ultimately reduce long-term HCC risks. Moving on to Hep C, I'm not going to belabor this too much because I know many of you are aware of these data. This is really a study published a couple years ago that emphasizes the high-risk Hep C population we face in the U.S., including incarcerated individuals, uh, drug use, homelessness, um, and really in, uh, emphasizes the importance of address understanding and addressing healthcare disparities that these populations face. Similar concept with Hep B, there's a very complex cascade from diagnosis to linkage to retention, treatment, cure, and long-term follow-up, especially patients that already have advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. And as illustrated here, similar to Hep B, there are many unfortunate opportunities for patients to fall out of the cascade that need to be um, thought of when seeing the patients in front of you that's uh, having difficulty with access to care. We've had some improvements already in the hep C cascade of care. We've evolved from risk-based eventually to universal-based hep C screening. We've also experienced significant improvements in hep C therapy that have achieved high rates of cure but we know that challenges still remain in linkage to care, particularly for high risk and vulnerable populations. This is a study we published a couple years ago, um, including uh, 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 four uh, safety net hospitals across the US, so almost 30,000 chronic hep C patients, um, pretty diverse as you can see here. Um, overall, concerningly, Despite the, uh, the availability of DAs during the study, early um, latter part of the study period, only 17% of this hep C population was treated in 2017. We also observed significant disparities. Uh, here in the blue and red line, we observed that Hispanic hep C patients had 52% um, uh, less likely to be treated with antiviral therapy. And also here, when we stratified by insurance status, sort of as expected in that time period, we found that patients with Medicare, Medicaid, and of course, who were uninsured, had significantly lower odds of access to hep C therapies. This is important because these primarily affect, again, those vulnerable populations, minorities at risk and vulnerable groups that receive care within safety net settings. We also looked at um, something a little bit different, uh, mental health diagnosis. And this is really important because many of our patients do uh, have comorbid mental health and psychiatric disorders. And as illustrated here in the blue line, we observed that patients with underlying mental health and psychiatric disorders also experience significantly lower rates of hep C treatment. So it's sort of a double, triple whammy to really think about disparities, not only do they experience uh, disparities due to low SES, also risk factors? But in the setting of having comorbid mental illness, this additive disparity of lower access to hep C uh, uh, curative treatments is very concerning. As with hep B, why is important? Time and time again, we've seen and shown that hep C cure does reduce long-term risk. And particularly relevant to this conference, we know that hep C treatments and cure SVR does significantly reduce the risk of HCC as seen in this first figure in the left. Another popular, multiple other studies, the top one here is in the VA cohort, which shows again, SVR associated with much lower risk of HCC. And then here, in a, uh, I believe it was in a French cohort, again, we found that uh, hep C therapy not only reduces HCC, but also is associated with uh, a lower risk of hep C-related mortality. Moving on to um, uh, surveillance. You know, HCC surveillance is something I'm very passionate about in understanding disparities because it's one of the first and most important steps, I believe, in HCC cascade. Because really, you need to identify patients early in order to be able to offer them the most effective and potentially curative therapies. Unfortunately, time and time again, our studies have shown that HCC surveillance is suboptimal. 
This was a systematic and review, uh, a meta-analysis published just earlier this year that included 29 studies globally and found that the polled estimate of adequate HTC surveillance is 24%. I mean, 24%, really think about that. That means over 75% of patients that should be screened for HTC are not getting routine recommended screening. And that's really concerning because that directly translates into advanced stage HCC at presentation and HCC mortality. And we know from US SEER uh, NCI cancer data that despite our improvements in liver disease care and HCC treatment, that overall five year survival from HCC still remains less than 30 to 35%. That's very, very concerning. HCC screening also has its own cascade. And this, I would argue, is a little bit more challenging because you really need to first identify patients who are at risk and need screening. And that in and of itself is a challenge. And we need to provide more education to patients and providers about that. And with HCC, one-time screening is not enough. You need to get your initial screening and have follow-up for continuous surveillance or follow-up of lesions that are identified. Following that, you need to be able to plug patients into specialty care to get access to potentially curative and also um, you know, potentially uh, for, for patients that don't have uh, um, small localized lesions, other treatments that can help reduce tumor burden and improve mortality. This is a very complex cascade and there's very many opportunities that we need to improve on helping patients transition effectively through this cascade to get diagnosed and to get access to treatment. Many studies have shown disparities. And here I highlight three studies. First, published many years ago um, at a single center safety net hospital, I believe in Texas, where African-Americans were 39% less likely to receive surveillance versus non-Hispanic whites. In a large VA Hep C uh, registry, we saw similar, similar disparities. African Americans had much lower rates of HCC surveillance. And again, using the US national SEER Medicare data, African Americans had the lowest rates of HCC surveillance in this study at only 12%. I mean, these are very stark and concerning disparities, and we really need to do a better job and improving HCC surveillance in our cirrhotic and at-risk populations. Why is it important? Because the cumulative effects of disparities in a cascade of HCC, as I mentioned, lead to more advanced tumor at diagnosis, which leads to fewer options for curative therapy and ultimately lower HCC survival. Therefore, disparities in the cascade that affect ethnic minorities, which we've seen in the literature, and vulnerable populations, they further exacerbate existing barriers that these individuals already face in access to healthcare. And this is really, I'm not gonna read this, but just to emphasize that it's so complex and it's such a multifactorial consideration in trying to understand what are the barriers. Certainly there are patient factors that contribute to it, provider factors, but also system factors. And, and really any attempt to try and understand and address disparities in care need to comprehensively understand and also incorporate all aspects of patient, provider, and system level factors. Mitigating disparities uh, uh, in liver disease. We know that disparities arise from multifactorial contributors as illustrated in a previous slide. And they're really compounded by the complexity of liver disease care. I mean, we're just talking about HCC screening, but the critically ill patients with cirrhosis and the complexity of the management further um, exacerbates the, the difficulty and challenges in trying to manage these patients. We know that these patients are high risk and vulnerable populations. We also know um, from prior experience and studies that, that there's no one size fits all. We can create models and create algorithms, but we need to understand individualism of patient experience, their background, their SES, their culture, 
understanding. And we really need to incorporate a multi-pronged approach if we're going to be an effect, uh, inter, um, develop effective interventions to address these disparities. And really it comes down to education, integrating effectively in a system level potential interventions, and really trying to innovate and think outside of the box from what we're already doing to address the challenges and disparities that we currently face. So take home points, uh, hopefully I've illustrated that liver uh, chronic liver disease predominantly affects ethnic minorities and underserved vulnerable populations. The liver disease uh, care cascade is complex and it's particularly complex in our, in many ways, a fractured health care delivery model. Disparities in liver disease care are multifactorial and uh, reflect patient provider and health system barriers. And a comprehensive approach is needed that incorporates education, integration, and innovation and in healthcare delivery. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong, for that fantastic and comprehensive talk. Um, I think, you know, as questions come into the chat box, one of the things that really struck me was just the, you know, third to last slide on complexity. And I think that we need to think about the denominator here because so much of what we understand is just the patients who actually come in for hepatitis B and C testing or come in to have their screening. I think the denominator is probably much larger. And so given the audience of patients and caregivers and knowing that research is moving more towards having the patient voice. I'm just wondering what are some of your thoughts on how we can move the needle in improving access to care and really understanding the denominator? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think you illustrates such an important point. A lot of these studies sort of forget the, the missing population, all of those that are not linked to care, not being evaluated. And you know, depending on which uh, disease you look at, that population is vast. And I think that research and advocacy is certainly moving towards recognizing the importance of the patient voice and patient advocacy and advocating for um, education, access, resources. Um, you know, I was just on a, a call, I forgot yesterday or the other day, but uh, you know, programs like the Global Liver Institute, which is a huge patient advocacy group, I think are doing amazing things. And in educating, but also I think arming patients with the resources to ask the right questions. Ask questions um, about their care. What should they do? What should they be aware of? Because when we engage patients, I think ultimately it helps improve their, 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 the care that they receive. Yeah, I, I think it's important to note, I mean, among all the foundations that are dedicated to, to liver disease. So there's ALF, GLI, there's a number of local foundations that are really trying to get patients um, and just people in general. I mean, I think that our bias as physicians is that we always think about our patients, right? Because that's yeah. who we take care of. But I think to really move the needle from a population health perspective, we really need to get active in policy and um, really understanding that preventive health and the fact that, you know, while we have long since uh, talked about vulnerable or marginalized populations, bringing normalcy to things like testing for hepatitis B and C in everybody over 18, um, you know, those types of population health and public health measures, I think will not only make people more amenable to coming forward to, to get care if they need it, um, but also there's no stigma associated with, you know, when you have, you know, the, um, you know, a government, uh, you know, like the United States um, Public uh, Health Services Task Force say, listen, everybody over 18 should get a one-time test for hepatitis B or C, then it just becomes part of routine, you know, health maintenance, right? And so all of that stigma, I think, is then diminished. Um, so I think that's really important is to understand that population health and to move the needle on preventive health requires um, a normalization of what were probably erroneously stigmatized, you know, risk factors in the past. Yeah, I, I think I, I love what you said because it's, 
It's so important um, to normalize because we've seen time and again with HIV and Hep C that risk risk based screening is, is really failed. And it's, you know, we've seen Hep C evolve. And um, I hope with uh, time and very soon that we'll have the same evolution with, with hepatitis B. And I, you know, I do think that we should implement similar measures uh, as we have for Hep C to, to test all for Hep B to really, as you said, normalize it, not gain stigma, but also capture the, the many, many, I think, Hep B patients that are un underdiagnosed and unaware um, you know, in the U.S. Right, right. And I think it's really important, the take-home message with Hep C is that, you know, over 30% of patients who are diagnosed with Hep C have no earthly idea how they got it. Yes. Um, and I would say it's the same probably for Hepatitis B. And so, you know, I think it's really important just to underscore how uh, so many people are missed and that how it's totally reasonable to say to your doctor, hey, I'd like to have this test for hepatitis C, or I'd like to have this test for hepatitis B. And so I'd, I'd really like to arm the people listening to, to go ahead, ask, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. So, yeah. all right. Yeah, that's really important. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wong. Um, I appreciate your time today. I'm gonna go ahead and keep moving down the program. I'd like to introduce Dr. Ali Zarampar as our next speaker. And Dr. Zarampar is an associate professor um, in the Division of Transplantation and Hepatobiliary Surgery at the University of Florida College of Medicine in Gainesville. Dr. Zarampar earned his medical degree from the University of California, San Francisco, and he also got a doctorate degree in biochemistry there. And he completed his general surgery residency and fellowship in multivisceral transplant and hepatobiliary surgery in the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, he's a transplant surgeon and um, he is a multivisceral transplant surgeon. He's uh, certified in multivisceral transplantation through the American Society of Transplant Surgeons. And it's our pleasure today to welcome him to speak on transplantation and also to thank him for his service to the planning committee. Dr. Zarenpar, it's all yours. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tade, for the, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, welcome everyone. We really enjoy having you here, and I welcome any questions, whether it's during the uh, during my talk or um, afterwards. Um, I do want to talk about transplantation, um, but I also want to talk about uh, the fact that it's a continuum. Um, you know, basically, my job as a surgeon, uh, not just as a transplant surgeon, but as a hepatobiliary surgeon, is to take a look at the patient and try to uh, basically, you know, personalize the treatment um, of their liver cancer that they're seeing me for to that person. And it means, um, what it really means is trying to figure out, you know, overall, what would really best serve that patient? Um, it may not even be surgery. Uh, and so, you know, the overall treatment goal um, for us is to increase the duration and the quality of life. Um, of course, that a lot of times involved, re involves removing all their tumor cells. It involves getting clear margins, and it involves preserving liver function, um, liver tissue, liver function, to minimize the fact that you know, we're removing a whole bunch of liver, and if we remove too much, they could go into liver failure afterwards. So it's a, it's a big question. It's a global question. We need to figure it out how best to do it. And I think of transplantation as sort of like the biggest liver resection. So I'm going to talk a little bit about liver resection. So cutting a part of the liver out um, at the beginning. And I'll, and I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, why we, why and when we do liver resections and why and when we don't do liver resections. The idea is that for liver resection, we want to remove um, all the cancerous foci, all the cancerous cells. And whether that means also cutting out um, if there's tumor in the veins, if there are tumors in the satellite nodules, um, we have to do that. We have to get rid of all of those. Um, and the best way of doing that in terms of liver resection is to do what's called an anatomic resection. So we don't just go in there and cut out a piece of the liver that just has the tumor. Um, we have to remove an anatomic part where there's blood flow coming into that whole segment and blood flow coming out of it. And time and time again, studies have shown that 
overall, if you do this, uh, the outcomes are significantly better, whether it's an overall survival or what's called disease-free survival, so surviving without having that disease come back. That's better than what's called a limited resection. Um, in terms of margins, there doesn't seem to really be a big difference uh, as long as your margins are negative in terms of overall outcome. Um, but for some tumors that don't have an obvious vascular territory, there some people have found that there's less recurrence if you have a bigger margin or not. So that's um, kind of a liver resection. So why would we not want to do a liver resection? Well, so the arguments against cutting out just a piece of the liver is that yes, um, cutting out a piece of the liver takes out that tumor. But really, um, most liver cancer comes, it arises in a bed of sort of bad damaged liver. Uh, so, you know, the idea is that your liver gets injured, whether it's by hep C or hep B or fatty liver disease or autoimmune or whatever it is. <clears throat> and the liver gets injured and it repairs itself and it gets injured again or it repairs itself. And in this process, those cells make mistakes in, in division. And, and one of those mistakes leads to cancer. But it's the whole liver that has gone through these cycles of injury. So we think of the whole liver as being a bed of precancerous tissue. And in fact, um, in hepatitis C, if you look at all comers, um, up to 90% of people who have had liver resections for liver cancer in, in hepatitis C, within five years will have a recurrence of, of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, this was before the new hep C drug, so those data um, are a little bit old, uh, but really there is not much evidence um, that uh, treating hepatitis C virus does much to decrease the risk of liver cancer. Um, and so, you know, if, uh, if you have hep C and you get your hep C drug and you're cured, you know, miracle drugs, right? Be cured of hep C, um, uh, you still have a risk of developing hepatocellular carcinoma because that liver is damaged and, and it has the sort of precancerous quality. Um, what about other uh, alternatives to liver resection? Not necessarily transplant, but um, non-surgical methods. So non-surgical methods, I'm talking about um, embolization. So whether it's uh, just bland embolization where the radiologists go and put beads into that part of the liver to cut off the blood flow or chemoembolization where these beads have some chemotherapy drug or radio embolization where these beads have radioactivity. So that uh, is one option. Other non-surgical methods would be uh, what's called ablation. So most of the time people these days do what's called microwave ablation. Uh, this is again, most of the time done by radiologists who will stick a needle into the tumor from the outside. They'll find it on CT scan or on ultrasound. They'll stick a needle in there and they'll basically microwave the tumor. It's like a microwave antenna that you stick into that piece of the liver and it burns that area. Um, or we can do it laparoscopically or surgically if the radiologist can't get to it or you know, we do an operation and we find that we can't cut it out, we, we can do that. Um, so yes, uh, those are options. And, and also external, external beam radiation is, is another option that more and more people are, are doing uh, these days because it's got pretty good outcomes. So when would you do those? Um, the, you know, for whatever reason, the patient's not a, a surgical candidate, these are options because they have much lower morbidity and mortality because it's not a big operation. Cutting out a piece of the liver is a pretty big operation. And so um, when you can avoid doing a big operation uh, because the patient you don't think will tolerate a big operation, these are certainly options. What you're giving up is some, you know, you're giving up some decrease in recurrence rate. So there is an increase in what's called local recurrence. So that tumor that you're treating with either, with any one of these non-surgical methods, that tumor may come back. 
But it really, again, neither surgery nor these ablations have any effect on the entire liver. And in fact, what a lot of people have found is that a patient's ultimate survival depends on the underlying liver disease itself, as opposed to, um, you know, that specific tumor. So we have to keep that in mind. And what's the other, the other issue with liver resection? Well, the other issue is that um, almost three quarters of the patients that, that find out they have liver cancer are just not eligible for liver resection, whether it's because um, they've got tumor outside the liver, whether it's because they have multiple tumors or tumors on both sides of the liver that would require too much liver to be taken out, uh, whether it involves um, you know, tumor in the bile ducts, tumor in the main portal vein, in the vena cava, these are big veins that are going into and out of the liver. There's tumor there. Um, these patients are not candidates for liver resection. And so when the vast, vast majority of the patients who get diagnosed with liver cancer are not eligible for liver resection, we need to have other options. And one of these options is liver transplantation. Right, so we talked about the fact that most liver cancer, most hepatocellular carcinoma is multifocal. Um, one tumor is really sort of the tip of the iceberg in a lot of cases. And so you have to take out the whole liver. And when you take out the whole liver, this is what's called the best oncologic resection. The best cancer operation is to take out as much as possible to clear that whole bed. And um, because a lot of patients have cirrhosis, liver transplantation is the way to treat it. The, you know, it's the only way to treat cirrhosis um, and it restores normal hepatic function, right? It restores normal liver function. And so there are people who, you know, I've had people come in they're for liver transplantation, they're, they're, they were at work, uh, their turn came up they're, um, for liver transplant and you know, they were doing just fine and they were getting transplanted for liver cancer and when they get a transplant and afterwards they are amazed at the fact that, you know, they thought they were felt okay, but that this new liver is actually making them, you know, kind of giving them a new spring in their step because they didn't realize, you know, the liver, cirrhosis is, is an insidious disease in the sense that it's a slow onset makes, uh, you know, it comes on slow and people don't really realize how much it's really affecting their lives. And so if they have cirrhosis and they get, you know, uh, liver transplant and with normal liver function, um, even though they thought that they were just fine, they feel a lot better. Um, so liver transplantation is, is curative, right? It's potentially curative. Um, and, you know, we talked about a little, a little bit about cirrhosis, but really it's the best treatment option for anyone, um, whether or not they have cancer, who has decompensated cirrhosis. Right, so decompensated, meaning the liver is just not doing the thing that it needs to do. It's not clearing the bilirubin, it's not synthesizing, uh, it's not making cl uh, clotting factors, it's not making albumin, so these people have edema and some ascites of fluid in the abdomen. Um, so the liver is just not doing its thing. And so when can we transplant for liver cancer? So about I guess 25 years ago now, uh, this group in Italy came up with the criteria that they showed um, need to be met for patients to have good long-term survival. Because before that, um, you know, one of the very, you know, the very first few liver transplants that were done were for liver cancer. Um, and soon people found out that you can't transplant for liver cancer just any old liver cancer because a lot of these things were coming back. So it took about 20, 30 years to figure out who are good liver cancer patients, who would be a good candidate for a liver transplantation. And so um, they, this group in Italy uh, came up with the, what's called, what we now call the Milan criteria. And so the Milan criteria are that you can have one tumor, but if you have one tumor, it can't be bigger than five centimeters. Or if you can, have, you can have up to three tumors in your liver, but none of them can be bigger than three centimeters, right? So one tumor, no bigger than five, or three, none of which are bigger than three. Uh, and then you can't have tumor outside of your liver. 
and none of your major blood vessels um, can have, you know, the big named blood vessels can have two more of them. And so these are the Milan criteria. Now, since then, that was, that was published in 1996. And so since then, what, uh, what we found is that uh, those criteria were probably a little too restrictive. And so um, although we've stuck with the Milan criteria, what we have now is the ability of getting people who have tumors outside of these criteria, so bigger tumors or more numerous tumors, if we can treat those tumors with, uh, with what I previously referred to as local regional therapy, so the ablations or the embolizations, if we can get those tumors to shrink or go away, and now the tumors that are remaining in the liver fit within the long criteria, those patients are also acceptable for liver transplantation. And so what does it mean for acceptable? So basically, if patients meet these Milan criteria, five-year survivals are better than 75% uh, with transplantation, which is you know, really pretty good. Um, and so uh, you know, more than three quarters of people are alive after five years after having a big operation like a liver transplant. And the tumor recurrence rates within these criteria are less than 15%. So people do very well, as long as they meet these criteria, as long as we're able to get them to meet these criteria. So, um, you know, I've said a lot about why we should not be doing liver resections for all patients. Well, who are the patients that should get a liver resection? Well, if they have no liver disease, right, if the liver itself is fine, and they, you know, there are some patients uh, who... Uh, by sheer luck or whatever it is, have no liver disease, but they develop a liver cancer. And so in those patients, a transplantation is virtually never indicated. And so those are the patients who should have a liver resection. Um, what about uh, resection versus ablation? Well, you know, there are some tumors that are just not favorable for ablation or embolization, whether these are bigger tumors that are still on one side, so they wouldn't be um, transplant, but they were probably just too big for ablation or whatnot. Those, those should be resected if they're in some sort of uh, inaccessible or unfavorable location for these ablations. Um, we can resect those. Some older patients, right? So uh, age is just a number, but there are older patients who, uh, who because of their sort of accumulation of comorbidities are not good transplant candidates. They've got other diseases, some uh, cardiac disease, uh, whatnot. And they're not liver transplant candidates, but they would be able to tolerate our liver resection. So those would be, um, that would be an argument for a liver resection. And then, you know, I tell everyone, if I was able to just go to the back room and pull a liver off the shelf, I'd be transplanting a lot more people. But organ availability is a big deal. Right, so everyone needs to go on the, uh, be evaluated for liver transplantation. I'll go over you know, what we think about when we um, evaluate liver transplants uh, a little bit later. But you know, because it's a limited resource, um, organ availability is a big argument to resect someone as opposed to wait for something to become available uh, sometime down the line. So what about other, other reasons to do resection? Um, so the extent of tumor uh, is, a, is a big, uh, you know, these are things that we have to consider. There are tumor size limits for transplantation, uh, but not for resection, right? So um, big tumors, we, you know, as long as they're anatomically resectable, we can resect those. Um, there are cases uh, in which there are vascular, there's vascular invasion. Um, and we can't transplant those patients, but because there is some chance, right? Even though the chance of, of total cure is remote, because we're not, you know, taking that, taking a liver away from someone else, uh, in cases of vascular invasion, we will occasionally give patients a chance by resecting those patients. And then, um, you know, these are again, these vascular invasion ones, uh, Sometimes we'll resect them because if we don't resect them, uh, the outcomes would be actually a lot worse than resecting them. There's a, you know, they have a high likelihood of, of metastasis and they're not amenable to ablation. So we will um, consider resecting those patients. 
Uh, and so that's kind of uh, what I want to conclude this portion um, in terms of transplant versus resection is that, you know, everyone who comes in with liver cancer to our clinic um, has to be staged. We need to figure out exactly what's going on with them. We need to get the best imaging possible. We need to figure out sort of what their background liver disease is, get a good idea of what's what has caused the liver disease, how extensive it is. And then we need to do a, a really good overall medical assessment. And so, um, you know, that's what I meant when I said that the liver cancer treatment plans must be individualized to optimize patient outcomes, right? So it needs to be, um, you know, we need to figure, everything needs to be on the table. And it's really important to get early referral uh, to centers that are able to offer these. It needs to be a multidisciplinary approach, right? You don't want to go to someone who just has a hammer. You want to go to people with different tools um, who can offer you different complementary types of treatment. So it's not just a transplant, it's not just a resection. Everything needs to be on the table. Non-resection uh, needs to be on the table. Clinical trials need to be on the table. Uh, systemic chemotherapy needs to be on the table. Palliative care needs to be on the table. Everything needs to be on the table. And, and, and it's important to get, you know, to a big sort of uh, center because liver cancer is, um, you know, it's a, it's a serious deal. And so I do want to also talk about sort of how we, um, uh, how we think about uh, transplantation. And I tell everyone who I see for transplant, look, um, you're, you're here because you're undergoing a liver transplant evaluation. And we try to answer um, three questions. Question number one is, do you need a liver transplant? Question number two is, are you gonna make it through a transplant, walk out of the hospital? And question number three is, are you gonna be able to keep this liver for a long time? So the first question is, um, do you need a liver transplant? And this is where your hepatologist um, is playing a big role. Um, you know, we need to figure out, is your disease caused by your liver? Is it caused by something else? Um, would giving you a new liver fix the disease or is it just, you know, is, the, is that disease going to take over the new liver and, and uh, waste that liver? You know, what's, what is really the cause of your, of your problem? The second question is, are you gonna make it through the transplant operation? Transplant operations, you know, one of the biggest operations we do these days. It's a big incision. Uh, we take the whole liver out, put a new one in and uh, you know we, we clamp all the blood flow into the liver, clamp all the blood flow out of the liver. It basically while that's clamped, it cuts off the blood flow from the lower half of your body that normally goes back to your heart. Let me take those clamps off and suddenly all this blood is coming back and your heart really takes a beating and right next to the heart's the lungs. So we have to make sure that your heart's good, your lungs are good, you don't have any other major medical problems, there's no ongoing infection. Your nutrition is good. Um, you know your re rehab is fine. So all that stuff. Um, so uh, people see a whole bunch of uh, you know, consultants, dietitians, physical therapy, uh, hepatology, cardiology, pulmonary, um, just to make sure that we know everything. You know if there are other issues like autoimmune issues. Um, uh, rheumatology will 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 see folks. Um, what not? Uh, and then in terms of the last question of whether you're going to be able to keep this liver for a long time has to do with things like, um, do you have insurance to pay for immunosuppression for the rest of your life, right? So it's, it's uh, the transplant means that you're not getting, you know, it's not your liver, right? So your body's going to want to reject it. And so we have to suppress the immune system. And we do that with immune suppression. And you're going to be on immunosuppression for the rest of your life. Uh, so, you know, do you have insurance to pay for that? Do you have folks around to take care of you? Because everybody has some sort of speed bump after an operation, whether it's a small speed bump or a big speed bump, you're gonna need someone to help take care of you. Um, and so it's not something that people can go through by themselves. So we assess that. Um, we make sure that uh, folks are gonna, you know, it's, it's a long process, right? It's the rest of your life. So uh, you're gonna be able, to, and you're gonna need to listen to your coordinator. Um, when they tell you to come to clinic for follow-up to take your medications uh, the way that you need to, to, uh, you know, um, get your labs done appropriately. Uh, we want to make sure that people don't go back to drinking alcohol, you know, if they were drinking alcohol before. 
So these are these are big questions that we need to assess. And then everyone gets together. We talk about uh, we talk about folks on the medical review board. I mean, you know, we make a decision as to you know, yes, the patient should be listed. No, they shouldn't be listed. Or we need more information or more time to figure things out. So that's basically kind of the the brief summary of uh, of sort of transplant resection and whatnot. There was a question from Don saying, is it normal that a full transplant uh, gets a hepatic artery? Yes. So um, the artery, the hepatic artery comes with the transplant. The portal vein comes with the transplant hepatic vein. So yes, all the vascular reconstructions come with the, uh, come with the transplant. Dr. Zarenfar, thanks so much for such a whirlwind. Um, I think there are quite a number of questions. So um, I'm going to read from the chat and see if you can help answer these very important questions about transplantation. So the first one is, you know, you talked about the fact that people will have to be on immunosuppression for the rest of their lives, which is really important to prevent, you know, rejection of the new liver. Can you give us a sense of sort of how many medications and how they may change over time? Uh, yeah, so it varies over time. And so, you know, compared to other organs, the liver is pretty good in terms of not being, sort of not generating rejection. Uh, but initially, you know, uh, during the first couple of weeks and first couple of months, we are on a lot of immunosuppression. We start off with, a, you know, most places start off with three drugs, three drug immunosuppression. There's a steroid uh, component. There's a component that's called a calcineurin inhibitor. Most people get tacrolimus. And then there's an anti-proliferative component. Most people use mycophenolate. And so three drugs, you know, uh, once or twice a day. And uh, then you have the drugs that you take for some of the side effects from, from these things. Then you take some of the drugs from your pre, you know, before transplantation, if you had hypertension or if you had diabetes or whatnot. But yeah, so you start off with a lot of um, immunosuppression. And then gradually over time, the steroids will go down. Steroids for the most part are the first drug that we, that we peel off. And also the dose of the calcineurin is what we start peeling off. And, and you know, by about three, you know, depending on your center and depending on what disease you had to begin with, um, you're pretty much on two drugs by about, you know, anywhere between month one and month three. And by about one year, you're on low, much lower dose. And then a lot of the medications will come off. Um, so yes, it, it, you know, it gets better over time, but the first year, you know, certainly the first few weeks and the first few months are much more intense and then things get better over time. Thank you. Um, the other question that was posed is, I, I mean, I think it's a very difficult question to answer in terms of just in the time we have, but perhaps you can talk a little bit about the process is, you know, are there risks and side effects of a liver transplant and how, you know, how do you approach that with a patient? Yeah, so it's a big deal, right? So um, like I said, it's, a, it's one of the biggest operations we do these days. So, uh, you know, we have five different connections and any one of those can either leak or they can get too tight, right? So whether they leak, it's a bleed or a bile leak, or if they get too tight, you can clot your, uh, your blood vessels. So those are, you know, the things that we worry about. Um, but I think probably the, the best answer I can tell you is when you look at survival over time, more than 95% of people are alive at the end of one year when you look at you know, transplantation for liver cancer. So people do really well. Um, and when you think about the fact that, you know, we're talking about people with liver cancer that were, and also cirrhosis, for people to really be, you know, have that high survival is really excellent. Of course, if you're that, Five percent. It's not so excellent, but uh, you know, it, it. You know, we don't transplant for small cancers that are otherwise treatable. So you know, it's uh, these are you know these are sick patients. Um, the immunosuppression is probably the uh, you know some of the some of the risks that we also should talk about. Um, it, immunosuppression suppresses your immune system. You don't reject, but also you know your immune system does other things, right? So it fights infections. So you're more likely to develop infections that normal people don't get, like weird infections normal people don't get, or you get more serious infections compared to the regular non-immune express person. And the immune system also fights cancers. So you're more likely if you had a cancer, and that's why we screen for cancers before transplantation, non-liver cancers before, 
um, those tumors will grow faster. Or you're more likely to develop things like most commonly skin cancers or lymphoma. So it's very important to really have a good follow up, have a dermatologist wear long sleeves, sunblock, hats, um, and you know, make sure that you're looking for new lumps or bumps and just kind of keep in close contact with your coordinators and your primary care folks and, and uh, such. We have a couple more questions. One question, which I think you answered in part by discussing the Milan criteria and also downstaging in terms of how we think about liver cancer and the ability to transplant for liver cancer. Um, so the question is, why are some liver cancer patients eligible for a transplant and some aren't? But I think it might be helpful to just talk about the biology of liver cancer and the fact that things are unpredictable here. Yeah, so um, we, so there's the simple size criteria, right? So um, if we're just, if we're, if we're avoiding the whole, you know, other comorbidities, some people are just not eligible for transplantation because of comorbidities um, or social factors, right? If they're kind of living by themselves in a, in a trailer in the middle of the forest, right? If they, if they can't get access to medical care easily, um, I think those would, be, those would be things. And that, that goes into some of the disparities issues that Dr. Wong talked about. But let's just say um, in terms of biology, right? So bigger tumors, higher alpha feta protein levels, the AFPs that uh, we also measure, those are much more, uh, more numerous tumors, right? So these are things that are outside the criteria. They're much more likely to recur. And um, not just recur in the liver, but recur in the body. And what happens is that, and as I mentioned, is that immunosuppression basically blocks your immune system from fighting cancer. And if there are tumors outside of the liver that don't come out with transplant, because you're on immunosuppression, those things will grow a lot faster than if you had not gotten the transplant. And so that's why uh, we have these criteria. And also that's why we wait six months for people to be listed with liver cancer for them to get their sort of extra points for transplantation. Because what we found was that people who got listed for liver cancer and got transplanted quickly, they were actually doing worse than people who got listed for liver transplant and waited six months and had their tumor kind of figured out and treated. And those who were gonna sort of blossom with cancer elsewhere, those patients were not transplanted. So there is that biology that's really important. We need to figure out how bad this tumor is whether it's outside the liver and whether the transplant's gonna fix that problem. Thank you. Um, the last question is an anatomical one, but I think one that deserves some discussion, which is you know, that a lot of people don't realize that when they take your liver out, they also take your gallbladder out. And one um, person questions, why is it removed? Gallbladder is just the source of problems. So, um, so it's actually interesting because in the early days of liver transplant and in the early days when they were doing sort of the animal models, they actually used the gallbladder to connect the gallbladder to the intestine. So the gallbladder was used as the bile outflow. But soon what they found was that the gallbladder, so the blood flow to the gallbladder is pretty tenuous. And so when you do a liver transplant and you connect those arteries, you're likely to actually compromise the blood flow of the gallbladder. And so what happens is when you compromise the blood flow of the gallbladder is that that gallbladder becomes necrotic, it dies, it gives you like, it's, it's a source of infection. So it's a problem. Um, and so that's most of the reason why we take it out. And even if it were to be fine, and then three years down the line, you were to develop some sort of gallbladder problem, you don't want to go back in there in a place where been operated on one of the biggest operations is a lot of scarring and the gallbladder is just it's just a problem um so you know you don't need your gallbladder gallbladder removal and is one of the most like common operations we do in the united states like forty five thousand a year or something like that um your body accommodates to removing the gallbladder uh and yeah that's really kind of the it's it just it's just a problem yeah, I, I personally don't like gallbladder, so I'm right there with you. <laughs> um, all right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Zarenpar. I wanna thank both Drs. Wong and Zarenpar for this morning. We've had a great start to the day.
because I think, you know, we're all here because of you. Um, so patients really are our purpose. Um, and this brings me to probably the best part of today, which is hearing from patients and their providers. Um, so I really want to welcome our group of speakers for the last half of today's session and specifically our first speaker, who's Don Melillo, one of our National Patient Advisory Committee members and advocates. And Don is going to tell us a little bit about his story. Thanks, Don. I, first of all, I really want to thank American Liver Foundation and Ivory and every doctor that's involved. Uh, I was involved with the conference last year just as a participant and fell in love with what I saw and heard. And uh, so I really I want to thank you for inviting me today to be able to share a little bit about my story and maybe help someone else because uh, I really, it, I, I really think that the American Liver Foundation, the resources and the programs they offer can help so much, uh, so many people and help us so much. And so I encourage you to get involved and uh, you know, take part in all the various seminars and programs that we have. But my story started and actually last Tuesday or this, this Tuesday, I celebrated nine years as a liver transplant recipient. And Dr. Zirin, per if I got it right, uh, I really absolutely loved hearing his story today because I went through part of that. And 11 years ago, I had my transplant, or 11 years ago, probably, I started having stomach issues. And Dr., uh, it was my GI doctor that really, wouldn't give up on me. And in 2011, I had problems and he said, I'm gonna start talking to some other doctors and he did. And in February of 2012, I was diagnosed with having liver cancer. And it's because uh, my doctor wouldn't give up on finding what was wrong with me uh, that found that I had liver cancer. And then in, in my story, uh, I remember the first time I went to my transplant doctor and I said to him, and we heard earlier, you know, look for alternatives or, you know, other options. And so I said to him, doc, what happens if I don't have a transplant? And he looked at me and said, you'll die. And my wife afterwards said to me, you were only kidding that you weren't thinking about having a transplant. I said, no, I just wanted to know what my options were. And so we ruled out the option that I wouldn't have a transplant. And because of where my cancer was, we've heard about the sectioning. We talked at first with my doctor about being able to section off the bad part, but where my tumor was, that wasn't an option. My only option was full transplant. And I actually asked the question earlier about the hepatic because where my cancer was, was right where the hepatic comes in. And so my only option was uh, to have a total transplant. And uh, I received my donor's hepatic. And I often wondered, is that normal or not? So today I got my answer, so I appreciate that. But uh, I, I, the, the biggest thing that I encourage everyone to know is that today something may not work, but by midnight tonight, it may. And you can't ever give up hope. And I, I use a quote uh, by uh, uh, Henry Ford. And it was a quote that I think that applies to all of us. And that's, when everything else seems to be going against us, remember that an airplane takes off against the wind, not with the wind. So if an airplane can take off with all those people going against the wind through a lot of adversity, we too can get through the adversity in our lives. I have a grandson that has a lot of medical problems. He's had uh, 11 surgeries, he's 11 years old, but after surgery, nothing bothers him, but get a paper cut, you think he lost the finger. And so we all worry, we all worry about things and there's help out there and there's alternatives out there. And I just encourage you to look for the alternatives. Nine years ago, when I had my transplant, 
a transplant recipient wasn't offered uh, a high risk liver. And those livers were livers from hepatitis C or from drug overdoses. Today, my transplant doctor and team, they use those livers because hepatitis C can be cured. And I know that at UC, every person that's received one of those livers are cured of the hepatitis C within 30 days. And so, I mean, medicine is constantly changing. So you can't ever give up hope. You can't ever stop looking for maybe an alternative because what doesn't work today may very well work tomorrow. Uh, this past year, I was sitting on uh, an annual gala meeting that American Liver Foundation had, just listening to two of the doctors that came up with the cure of hepatitis C. Uh, it was amazing just listening to them saying, it's just part of our work. And I know listening to the doctors that have been involved here that they're always looking for something better. And so I just encourage everyone to don't give up hope. I mean, I'm at nine years later, I'm, I'm really thankful that I had a transplant because it taught me a lot. There's, there's things that I, I know now that I never knew before. I, I become a big advocate with our transplant group. I was the first patient to really speak to future patients. And I always told, tell, would tell them that I walked in the shoes and someday they're gonna walk in mine. And I do everything I can to help someone going through what I went through. And I know everyone else here you know, does the same thing. So uh, that's kind of my story. And uh, I thank all the doctors involved with American Liver Foundation because today maybe there's not a cure, but tomorrow there may be. And I, we just can't give up hope uh, that we won't find you know, something to help us. And, I know myself, I, I love giving back and being involved. And uh, so that's my story and I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Don. I, you know, I think you speak a lot to resilience and hope and curiosity, which really, you know, are three major fa factors in longevity, right? It's, you know, how yeah. do you deal with the cards you've been dealt? You know, how do you find solutions? And, and I love that perspective because I think that no matter what situation you're in, you know, you can really hope that you will find an alternative, a solution, somebody to talk to, et cetera. And the fact that you volunteer to speak to other patients is really important because we as doctors are always looking for people who can, you know, kind of share their story with patients and explain to them that, you know, what they're going through now seems so much in crisis mode, but nine years after the fact, you're enjoying life and your grandkids and whatnot. Well, yeah, one of the things I want to add is that, I mean, I'm, I went through a lot through my surgery. Uh, I'm allergic to tacrimolis. I guess if I took it, I'd know how to pronounce it, but uh, the number, one of the number one anti-rejection medicines they give uh, patients. I was allergic to it. It took UC two weeks to figure that out. They thought I had a brain aneurysm. Uh, I had a lot of bleeding afterwards. That was mentioned earlier. Uh, from what I understand, I had over 20 units of blood given to me. Uh, I, I signed cards after I first, uh, Don and I would sign cards, Don and others. But, and to your point, when people would ask me, how, I, how do I handle it? I used to tell them, it's like a poker game. It's not the cards I wanted, but it was the hand I was dealt and I have to play the hand. And um, I never gave up hope. Uh, there were many nights that I went to bed wondering if I'd wake up tomorrow, but I just never gave up hope. Yeah. So. Well, thank you, Don. I want to hear a little bit about Bruce Bauer's story. Uh, he's becoming something of an influencer on TikTok. Um, so I will turn it over to Bruce, who will tell us about his liver cancer story. Uh, first, as Don said, I wanted to thank the American Liver Foundation for allowing me to, to speak. Um, I'd be more talking more about some of the details and some of the treatments and some other things um, about my cancer. And <clears throat> About just over two years ago, I went in for a routine blood test. And from that blood test, they found some enzymes that were out of whack 
and uh, at ultrasound, and they found uh, nine tumors in my in my liver. My left tumor, my left lobe of my tumor of my um, liver was totally uh, gone. It was just one giant tumor, and in my right lobe, I had eight tumors. So I'm basically it's uh, inoperable, incurable, and I don't meet the criteria for a transplant. So I'm very jealous, Don, that you had a transplant. And, but I look at it that cancer does not define me. I just happen to be a person that has cancer. I live my life just like I would if I didn't have cancer. My doctors couldn't find a cause for it because I don't have hepatitis, I don't have cirrhosis. They just, I just have the cancer and no one knows why. Uh, so when, when you have cancer, you get a lot of blood tests. So if you any, have any fear of needles, make sure you get over it because you're gonna get stuck a lot. And I mean, a real lot. I already have scar tissue from, from my, some of my um, blood work. Um, when I get my results, First thing I look at is my AFP or the tumor marker um, result. If it's going up, I know my cancer is getting worse. If it's going down, it's getting better. Uh, when I was first diagnosed, I was at 60,000, which is basically off the chart for AFP. And uh, I got down to a low of 72 during one of my treatments. And I felt uh, really good at that point. And so some of the treatments I've had is levatinib, uh, radio embolization or Y90, immunotherapy. I was in a clinical trial for about 14 months, which was great. Because it, it worked out better than any of the other FDA approved drugs. And it was a phase one clinical trial. And that's when I got my, uh, AFP down to 72. Um, after taking, um, after being in the trial for so long, my numbers started to go up, my AFP numbers. So I was taken out of the trial, which was um, a very sad day for me because it'd been working so well for almost 14 months. So we took pictures and we found out it was just one tumor that was causing my AFP to go up. And uh, to make matters worse, that tumor was growing inside of my portal vein. And it was starting to impede the blood flow from the, por from the um, through the portal vein, which brings oxygen and nutrients to your liver. So if that portal vein got blocked, uh, that would mean uh, probably a much shorter life for myself. So um, in order to combat that, we uh, started on using photon therapy. So I had to go every single day for, for actually for 11 days to get a photon therapy treatment, which was all kinds of fun. And, uh, and the biggest thing is I, I had this treatment in mid-September and I have to wait till November to find out if I worked or not, because when you, bombard your tumor with, radi with radiation, it takes a while for it to, to work. First it gets inflamed, then it calms down, and then hopefully eventually it kills it. It's all known in 19 days, whether it worked or not. I'll get pictures the day before and then I'll take a look at it and see if it worked. Uh, during the same time, I started um, back with immunotherapy. And these are the two drugs that were mentioned yesterday in combination. I'll use the brand names. And they are um, Decentric and Avastin. And again, I believe this was mentioned yesterday in the, uh, in the conference. And so far, they seem to be working pretty well. I had a treatment yesterday in three weeks from uh, before yesterday, in the last three weeks, my AFP has gone from 10,400 
to 1,080. So it's down, down over 9,000 points in three weeks, which is, for me, very I'm very excited about that. And I hope everyone would be excited about that. Um, I'd acquired a lot of knowledge through my, the last two years, two plus years of having liver cancer. So just over a year ago, I decided to share my knowledge and I started making a series of TikTok videos for people that were newly diagnosed with liver cancer. I wanted to know what they're in for, how their lives could have changed, the good, the bad, and the ugly, everything about it. And one of my favorite TikTok videos is, um, it's called Don't Leave Your Spouse in the Dark. I'm terminal and sometime I'm gonna die. And I do all the, I pay all the bills, I do the taxes, anything financial I do in the house. So what I did is I, I created a very detailed process, how to pay the bills, when to pay them, which based, which accounts they come out of. I also created a detailed process to pay the taxes. And I created a budget going out four years so my wife could see long-term if we're gonna be in any kind of financial trouble or not. And she could take um, steps to correct that, that problem. My biggest pet peeve, and I think Don, you could relate to this, is waiting. You wait, you go to the doctor's office, you wait three hours for your appointment that was supposed to be two hours ago. You wait for test results, like this uh, radiation radiation treatments I had. I, I have to, had to wait seven, eight weeks to get the results. And uh, even when I switch treatments, there's called a, it's called a washout period. So I have to wait till one medicine goes out of my body so they can start the new medicine. And during those three weeks, I have a very aggressive cancer. So um, it, it starts growing very quickly before I start that new treatment. And so just some, some recommendations from me as a uh, terminal patient is when diagnosed with cancer, I recommend the following. Uh, be your own advocate. Do the research on your cancer. If the doctor says something you don't understand, don't, don't stop there. Ask questions until you get the answer that you, you want, that you understand. Sometimes doctors will, not all doctors, but sometimes doc doctors will just go through something very quickly without you really knowing what they're talking about. And I'm someone who wants to know what a doctor is talking about. So I'll stop them and say, we're not leaving this office until I understand what exactly is happening and what you're talking about, and how it's gonna affect my body and so forth. Um, I said this earlier, as best as you can, live your life as normal as possible. Don't let cancer Control your life. And um, again, I'm had, I have cancer. I, I live my life as normal. I work out. I try to do volunteer work in, in various types of environments. And I don't let it control me. I control the cancer. <clears throat> Another very important thing is to have a great support system in place. Um, family, spouse, uh, friends, and as you know, cancer can be very stressful, especially when you're you're feeling very sick from more from the treatments than the cancer itself. And at that point, it's really important to have someone to talk to. And um, many hospitals will provide people in the social work to to talk to you. And um, another important thing as I talked about earlier is ask about clinical trials. Some work, some may not work, but for me, it gave me 14 months of, uh, of life, of additional life. 
Um, so for me, it worked, worked pretty well. And um, lastly, uh, if you're a terminal like myself, make sure that your wishes are known and are documented in your advanced directives before you die. Get a will, make sure everything is in that will, uh, do your advanced directives, talk to your spouse if you're, if you're married, and really be on the same page as far as what you want done after you pass away. Uh, that's pretty much it. I want to thank you all for, for listening. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to uh, answer them. My TikTok is Bruce Bauer. And I have about uh, 12,000 followers and about 50 or so videos. And it's, it's been like therapy for me. My followers give me encouragement. And they've been great. So uh, anything I can answer and help with, I'm happy to do so. Thanks so much, Bruce. That's an incredible story. I think one of the things you highlighted is just the frustration of the healthcare system and, and the wait. Um, I think it's really hard to wait. And I think it's really hard, no matter what illness you have, to wait and there are systemic weights and there are biological weights and the weighting can be very, very difficult. Um, but I think you've really highlighted the most important thing, which is that you control how you're gonna to respond to this. You don't let it control you. And because of that, I think you've been able to develop the distance that you need to really think and plan for your future. And I always tell my patients how surprised I am that we plan for all these things in our lives, like births and graduations and weddings. And But, you know, when given the chance to plan for your passing, you could not. You could just sweep it under the rug. And instead, you've left a legacy for your family, for your wife. Um, you've protected her and made sure that she knows exactly what your wishes are, but also how you are financially in terms of how she can you know, go ahead when you're gone. And I think those things are just so important. And, and really, it's such, these are such difficult conversations and difficult things to think about. But the way that you've embraced them, the way you talk to others about them, it's really important. And, and I really appreciate you sharing with us today. No, thank you for having me. So I'm, I'm going to turn it over now to Barb Pitts, who's also a member of the National Patient Advisory Committee. Um, and Barb has done an amazing job at raising funds. She's raised over $50,000 for research um, in her Liver Life Walk fundraising. Um, and she's gonna tell us about her story. And then we have several questions in the chat box that we'll open up to all of the speakers. Thanks, Barb. Hi, everybody, I'm Barb. Um, I, uh, I feel terrible following Bruce because my story is so completely different. And I think that's why they picked the three of us. All of us have very different stories. I was, um, I, I was diagnosed with a liver disease or undiagnosed with one um, back in 1999. Uh, to this day, they still don't seem to know what I have. Um, but the one thing that we knew was it was very similar to PBC, but I don't have the PBC marker. So we kind of treated things that way. Um, and so I was put on the transplant list back in 2001, back before MELD existed, because had it existed, my MELD score would, would have been so high, I would have been transplanted immediately. My blood work was the highest they'd ever seen at Johns Hopkins. Um, but uh, I did really well. I looked great. I felt great. Everything was super. And so every year we would just, you know, do an MRI and, and do the checks and stuff. And I'd see my hepatologist once or twice a year. And, and I did really well until 2016. And then in 2016, I just seemed to get much sicker again. And so had a real issue with that and, um, you know, was back at the hospital a lot, but I transferred to Georgetown. And um, so we were doing my standard six month MRI at that point. 
and I get the little notification from the place I had it done. It was not at the hospital that said they had found lesion on my liver. And I mean, time just stopped. I, I just freaked out. I had no idea what that meant. I knew it could mean cancer. Um, so it was a little terrifying and it, it ended up taking about 10 days, I guess it was until it was confirmed and just like that ad that says, you never forget when you hear the words, you have cancer, you know, August 7th last year in the middle of the pandemic, you know, I, I get that call and um, immediately called my two closest friends and I don't have family. So they both ran to my house and said, screw the pandemic, <laughs> you know, we're hugging you. We don't care. We're here for you. And, and that is just such an important thing that Bruce mentioned about having support. I am blessed with having the most wonderful friends and the most wonderful support group anyone could ever hope for. And um, they get you through this stuff. Don't do this alone. That's stupid. You need people to help you with this, especially if you're like me and you don't have a spouse or children or someone who could, you know, be there for you. Um, so when I got the call from my, my patient, uh, my transplant coordinator, she said that, you know, there were two options. One was chemo and, and one was radiation. And, and then you really freak out. And she said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't freak out. We're not talking like chemo with the needles and you're gonna be sick and losing your hair. We're talking about either something called TACE or TARE, T-A-C-E or T-A-R-E, which is transarterial chemoembolization or transarterial radio, radio embolization, which one of the doctors had mentioned earlier. And um, so I met with uh, an interventional radiologist who was going to be performing the procedures for me. And um, luckily the lesion was very clear on, on the MRI. And so they decided the best course for me was to do the radio embolization. And I gotta tell you, I knew nothing about this. I'd never known anybody with cancer. I have a really good friend I've known since I was four who had a transplant. And so I, you know, I knew I could go to her and ask questions, but she had never had cancer. And so I remember the night before the first treatment, which is called mapping. Um, I was so nervous, my little dog could sense it. And when I got in bed, he put his little cheek right against mine the whole night long because I think he knew I was just terrified. And my, breast, my best friend went with me to the hospital. And um, so the mapping is simply where they go in and plan the procedure. They go in and, and do everything they would do except putting in the radio spheres. And that way they, they are prepared for it. They know what's where, you know, they can check everything out. So three days later, and this all happened so quickly. I mean, the mapping happened. I was you know, diagnosed August 7th, August 24th. They did the mapping August 27th. They did the treatment um, for the chemo embolization. You can only get one treatment for the radio. You can get two. And so we went in for my first one and I at least knew then what was going to happen. Um, does it feel good having a needle stuck up your groin? No, not at all. But you're in like a little bit of a twilight. They have to be able to talk to you and tell you to take breath and you know do all this stuff. It's like, okay, now release the breath because they're taking uh, pictures throughout this entire thing to make sure it's going the right way. And um, so, you know, it's like once they, Put a needle and you're done. Like Bruce said, get used to needles. You're going to be getting a lot of needles put in your period. And um, and so I uh, I finished the radio embolization and then they take you to this crazy big machine that somehow just spins around you. I don't even know what it's called. And it can take all those pictures that they had taken and make sure where everything was and look and make sure the radio spheres are in the right place. And so they were like, everything's great. You know, we'll see you in like 
two or three weeks it is, I guess a couple weeks. And so I, um, I went, uh, I, the next day I'm at home and I'm a little uncomfortable just because, you know, I'm very bruised where they stuck needles and stuff. But other than that, you know, I'm feeling pretty good. And so first a nurse calls me to check on me. Oh, I'm great. And then the doctor calls. And so it's like, wow, it's very nice that he's calling to check on me. Yeah, he wasn't calling to check on me. He was calling to tell me that they had actually found an aneurysm um, that was in my splenic artery. And so I'm like, what? You know, this is craziness now. So I, you know, I've got cancer. Now I've got this aneurysm. What's going on? So we knew I was going back into the, um, into the hospital for my quote second procedure on September 10th. And when I got there, I said about, so is it going to be the same as last time? And he said, no, what we did last time actually did everything we needed it to do. We got the whole tumor with the radiosphere. So we're not going to um, do any of that. We're simply going to treat the aneurysm today. And so, you know, we did that and they did a coil embolization with that. And it was basically the same as having the Y90 treatment, except they weren't shooting the spheres into me that time. And so um, my experience with liver cancer actually turned out to be, it sounds crazy, but probably the best thing that happened to me in 2020, which was such a lousy year, um, because if they had, if I had not had the cancer, they wouldn't have found the aneurysm and who knows what might've happened with that. But the best part of all was it made it where my MELD score was going to increase. For some reason, I had gone from having a hideously high number, you know, for my blood work and looking great to not looking so great. And my MELD score is like an eight, a 10. You know, I think the highest I ever got was like a 12. Oh, good. That won't even get you listed. I was just lucky that my doctor knew how sick I was because the first time he saw me, my belly looked like I was about to have twins any minute um, because I had so much ascites and had been through, you know, all the other stuff, ascites and varices. I, my liver was a disaster. And so um, on Valentine's Day, very appropriately, because it made me very happy and I loved it, um, my MELD score jumped up to being, you know, hey, let's get her near the top for a transplant. And it took a while, but I'm very excited to say that on July 9th, I did have my transplant. Um, and that would not have been possible had I not had liver cancer. And when they did the surgery, um, Dr. Guerra said, you know, he called my best friend when it was over at 3.30 in the morning. And so he said, you know, her liver, it's basically not doing anything. And um, my kidneys had been pretty badly damaged and I'm still working with kidney specialists now to try to get my kidneys back to par. Um, but it, uh, it, it would not have happened. And he said, you know, she didn't have months. She didn't have years. She probably had a couple weeks. And when I heard that, I, I was just horrified that somehow I had gotten that sick. And, you know, I wouldn't be here speaking to you now had I not had that transplant. So it was such a blessing in disguise, even though that sounds crazy that I had cancer because none of that would have been possible without it. Um, one of the things I do want to share, I know, I think both Don and Bruce had said about just keeping your spirits up. And this may sound totally stupid, but it's what I did as soon as they said I had cancer. I mean, that day I was doing it. I made little notes, little post-it notes. And um, I stuck them everywhere in my house. And they all were these little positive sayings. I'm one of those people who writes down sayings I hear all the time. And I was just flipping through all my books and looking on my phone where I have some stuff just to make sure I could find, you know, ones that would be perfect. And they were all about things like hope that Bruce said, you know, don't give up hope. You know, when you get to the end of your rope, 
you know, tie another knot in it and, and just hang on. And on my front door to this day, I still have two that say, um, don't give up, never give up. And I'm strong and I can do anything uh, because it's been difficult for me since the surgery. I've had several different complications. Um, my arm kind of exploded after the surgery. Uh, so I was one of those fortunate people who gets that from the IVs and we're still treating my arm. And um, so that's kind of a mess three months down the road. But uh, and we're working on my kidneys, like I said. But on the good side, I have lost 63 pounds because I had so much fluid inside of me. So, um, you know, it's like cancer, unfortunately for Bruce, it's, it's a really tough road. And, but for a lot of us, I think it's not that end all be all because there is still a chance that other things will turn out right for you. But please count on your friends. I mean, I... I had a group of 61 people that my best friend or I would email um, to let them know what was going on when I had my transplant and their emails and texts and cards and stuff. I don't know what I'd have done without them. I would not have gotten through it. Um, so get yourself a group. You know who your real friends are. Rely on them. And that's kind of it for me. So, uh, you know, Good luck to anybody who is going through this stuff now. I wish you all the best and, uh, you know, get those people praying for you and stuff. I had people chanting, go kidneys, and <laughs> suddenly my kidneys improved. <laughs> it was like, see, forget the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. I got the best cheerleaders there are. So, um, you know, use, use your friends, use your family, use, use those people. Thank you so much, Barb. I think it's really important just to um, underscore the themes that emerged from all three of your stories, which is that support and love is really important and it really doesn't matter who it comes from. Mm -hmm. um, and to really ensure that you are caring for yourself and caring for your spirit. Um, and that's tough, you know, when you're facing physical challenges and emotional challenges, but I think it's really the underpinning of, of how we cope. There are a couple questions. We have maybe a minute or two. Um, so maybe we'll take two questions from the group. One was um, directed at Don, um, but I think both of you can answer this, Don and Barb, which is, you know, how old were you when you were transplanted and how do you rate your post-transplant quality of life? Um, which of course is different. Don is nine years out and Barb, you're just, you know, a few months out. Um, but, but how would you answer those questions? I can go first since I'm nine years, but uh, I was 63 when I had my transplant. And uh, be honest, I, I'm absolutely wonderful. I do what I, I'm actually in Tampa, Florida right now. I'm at a boat race. One of my crazy hobbies is hydroplane racing. And uh, I was invited to come down. I'm not working this race, but I worked a lot of races this summer. But for the when I had my transplant, I often wondered whether or not I could get back to it. And I did. And, but I, I feel great. I have, I take my medicine the way I'm supposed to take it. I don't do anything that would ruin the gift that I got. Uh, there's just absolutely nothing that I do. Yeah. Maybe I, I shouldn't eat as many sweets as I do sometimes, but I do. <laughs> Uh, my kidneys have had issues, uh, but I always tell my liver doctor, don't worry about my kidneys until my kidney doctor worries about them. Uh, the, the other thing that I'm going to encourage is that uh, you have probably pharmacies that have programs that can help you with the cost of medicine. And I just went through that. They wanted to change one of my meds, my anti-rejection meds to something that's less evasive to my kidneys, but it was gonna cost me a lot of money. And the pharmacy at University of Cincinnati Health uh, said, well, fill out this paperwork. I'm getting the medicine that would have cost me $300 a month for free. And so there's, there's programs out there. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And, but I, at my health, I feel great. I had a heart valve put in last year 
And someone said, I Harville, I said, yes, I like new parts. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but I, I feel great. I do whatever I want. And, uh, but I, I, I try to take care of myself and listen to my doctors. And so that's me. And Barb? Uh, for me, um, you know, I'm just three months out now. And that is that first kind of milestone they try to get you to where, you know, things start to ease up a little. Um, I started out when people were asking about how many medications you take. Um, when I left the hospital, there were about 20. We got it up to 25 at one point. And now I'm down to, I think it's like 10 I take. Um, I also have diabetes, so, you know, a couple of those are insulin, but other than that, um, the tacrolimus is a little brutal on me. I, I get headaches. Well, I have a headache that just hasn't gone away. So, um, you know, I do get headaches, but the rest of the stuff each, it seems each week we'd be easing off of things. And then especially as my kidneys were concerned, you know, my kidney specialist then was like, we're stopping this medication, we're stopping that. Um, the meds aren't that bad. You get into a routine, it's, it's no big deal, but I feel so much better. And when people see me, they just can't believe I've had this major a surgery because I'm out walking every day and trying, I used to do six miles a day. Now I try to do 7,000 steps, um, which is, it's a lot when you consider I'm just three months out. So, uh, but no, I feel great. I, I thank God. And like Don said, God bless, you know, my donor. I, I said, I dedicate my life to just doing good and, and helping raise money for things like the ALF and for getting organ donors. I will do whatever I can because I know how much it helped me. Thanks, Barb. And the last question is uh, for Bruce. So Bruce, you talked a lot about self-advocacy and um, I'm wondering how you deal with it when you feel that you've been given sort of closed options and there isn't room for discussion with your physicians. Have you ever faced that? And how would you recommend other people deal with um, sort of really making sure that all their options are on the table and explained to them? Well, I think for me, the biggest thing is Make sure you know what you're talking about when you address those situations. So do do the research um, as much as you can. I must have been on the internet 200 hours uh, doing the research. But I, in in the trial, for example, I had the um, just move this out of the way. The um, they had mixed up the reports uh, mid 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 trial. And they had gotten the wrong report and not my report. So from the report they got, it showed that everything was going wrong and they were going to kick me out of the trial at that point. And I, I had the, the real report in my hand. So I downloaded it. And I said, whatever you're looking at is wrong. So look at this. This is as this is all the information. It's got my name, it's got my hospital number. Uh, this is the actual report. So I had to kind of calm down the, the clinical therapist and, and try to not be aggressive with them, but to be a, a little bit assertive and to bring them back into what I considered reality of what was happening. And uh, sat down with them, said, hey, this is the report. Everything looks fine on this report. Uh, it's a, a radiologist report and uh, convinced them that what they had was, was the wrong report. And I, I, to be able to stay in the trial. So I see really, really be knowledgeable about your disease. So you can talk intelligently mm -hmm. to your doctors, because you see a lot of doctors, as, as Barb said, you see you have radiation and intervention radiologist, you see a radiologist oncologist, you see an oncologist, you see a nutritionist, gastroenterologist, you see probably 10 different doctors as you're going through this. So, so know your stuff, be able to talk intelligently to, to the doctors you're, your doctors you're with 
that may have a different opinion of what's going on. I'm gonna turn it over now to Dr. Zarenfar for closing remarks. And again, thank you all for your time, for your expertise today. Uh, this has been a really uh, a very moving um, and very important part of, uh, of the presentations, just different experiences with liver cancer. Um, and you know, one thing I do want to say is that, uh, you know, it, people talk about beating cancer. Right, and I think that that's um, one of my pet peeves is that you know you're either beat cancer or are beaten by cancer, and it shouldn't be like that. Um, I think we're getting to a point where um, you know treatments are getting better. There are clinical trials out there. There are different approaches to treating cancer, such that while we may not be able to completely get rid of every sort of piece of tumor that's in there, doesn't mean that you know it's over. Right and and new treatments. Thankfully, you know the last last two or three years, um, the fact that there are all these other treatment options that are getting better and better. You know, before that it was just serafinib was the only medication that there was, and now there are more and more options. So, um, and maybe you know more and more are coming up. So I, you know I think that there is you, you, we need to keep going and we need to um, continue to uh, to maintain hope. Um, and to think about, you know, uh, continuing to live life, right? I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's key to be able to continue to live life um, and to continue to do good. Um, thanks, uh, Bruce, Don, and Barb for, for everything that you do and everything that you've, uh, you've mentioned. Um, and uh, do please uh, reach out to the American Liver Foundation as well as all the uh, all the resources that are listed there on your uh, on the the site now. Um, and just to close, um, feel free to reach out to us uh, if you have any other questions. And we do like to thank um, our sponsors, uh, Exalexis, our presenting sponsor, <clears throat> our premier sponsors, ASI and Genentech our signature sponsor, Merck, and our clinical trial session sponsor, Eureka. Um, thanks for joining us, and uh, I hope you keep in touch. When I think back on the last 25 years for the company, the learnings are deep and somewhat profound. We've done it our way. This is a hard business, but it's a really great business to be in when you've got the right team and the right mindset to go off and really attack some of the hardest problems in biomedical research. I think for most of us, when we start a company in the biomedical space, the objective is fairly narrow. We just want to solve a scientific problem. Hopefully the solution to that problem may lead to a drug, From everything from access to government affairs to all touch points in the organization, the patient is at the focus. Patients aren't only front and center in what we do, but Exelixis also works with a variety of patient advocacy organizations who work with us to create a united front in good public health policy. As every aspect of the organization evolves, how do we have the vision to create the next wave of clinical studies that will help address those patients' needs, even as better therapies come onto the market.